Okay, I'll read. Okay. Slow and easy. Yes, sir. This regularly scheduled meeting of the engineer committee of the Board of Architectural and Engineering Examiners is taking place in 308 Feathering Hill Hall at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. And notice of this committee meeting was posted on the board website on September 25th, 2017. We'll call for roll call. Roll call. Ricky Bursot. Here. Robert Campbell. Here. Stephen King. Here. Philip Lim. Here. Laura Weinbold. Catherine Ware. Here. You have a quorum. Okay, so we need a uh, we need a chair person for the engineer committee. Do we have any any motions? I make a motion we uh, elect Ricky Bursa. It's time he start pulling his way around here. Second. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, we have a motion in the second. Um, hey, he's good though. Okay, good, good. Um, let's have a vote. All in favor, say aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay, I'm put to work. All right, the, the first order of business is applications and audits for review. And we have, everybody should have the, um, the names in front of them uh, that we have to discuss, and we need to assign these to people to go over these. Are there are there any on this list that people have already looked at what would might make it quicker? I um, looked look at every one of them. Okay, so nobody's see. looked uh, at, because I, two or three, I think. I've looked at all of them. Okay, all right. Why don't we, um, Philip, why don't you take, um, is it Zuka? Is, is that how you say that? The first one, the interview yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Philip, why don't you take that one and take uh, Habib? And Habib too. Yeah. We gotta have. We gotta double up some here. And Robert, why don't you take uh, Hegenderger and Jaber? Jabber. Steve, why don't you take Johnson and Lamb? And Kathy, why don't you take Patterson um, and Wicker? Yeah. Can give everybody time to look over those.
Philip, why don't you let me know when you're ready to go. Uh, Mr. Suzuka, Adam, he's coming in for he's, an interview. He's coming in for an interview. He's coming in for an interview. Do you want to you want to just give us a preview? Yeah, of what? in August I was not here, but the comedian had a question about his job experience. Okay. And if you look at it, he's applying to take exam. I'm not doing interview, but you should ask him about a couple of questions. One is let him walk us through a project that he's done typically. Okay. Hopefully, he will have enough uh, knowledge to bring maybe his work, sample of his work, then we can kind of go through with him. Uh, maybe it's the way he presented the information to yeah. us. It's not quite clear. Like, we had a problem with the DDOT employee. They asked him what they do. I just coordinated the bridge. So I think the community can pick up real quickly. Okay. And I don't believe John, we, we had to make any decision today in front of him, right? After he leaves, we can't talk about it. Okay. Required to. I noticed that the information that is presented in and the experience on the on the iPads follows it's organized exactly like our our information on the website about progressive experience for engineers and that there's practical application of theory, management, communication skills. So anyway, there's been an attempt to take what we are asking for and organize it in that way. So that's that's so good. You, does the committee recall what was the sticky point on the office? I think he was, uh, he worked for a vendor bill and, and I think it was, uh, there was some discussion about whether he really did engineering work or whether it was kind of a pick it off the parts list. You know, when somebody calls in and says, I want a HVAC unit that does this, this, and this, do you just go down and say, okay, right there it is, or do you actually put systems together? I think that was kind of the, uh, the uh, discussion. That helps. That's good. And I think, I think when, when an individual comes in and talks through the project, he got it, I'm sure he knows how to talk. Okay. And that's what I would recommend to the community. The next one okay. I have yeah. Habib. Now, yeah. Habib is, he actually met all the qualifications. The only thing that is the sticking point was in 2014, he was found by the board as misconduct. If you look at his court order, it was actually a contention between him and the architect. At the time when the board was investigating, he decided not to renew his license and let it back. So now he wants to reapply. I think he, he didn't make good what where he has left. So the way I would look at it, uh, if there was a complaint open on him, then he let the license left. We really don't have any more jurisdiction over him. So in that case, if he wants to come back to that, we need to come back. Just reopen the full 2014 case. I'm sure we're still allowed to reopen the case, but have him and resolve it. And if the committee is satisfied with it, I think we should take one more step, interview him personally, and then um, let, him, let him take the law and rule the case and pass it. Let him go on. We have been pretty good about forgiving people, especially when people have a consent order or from another jurisdiction, another state, and if it is more than five, six years, and they're still clean, like the one that the one I looked at last time, well, one of the one of the guys he actually was doing plant stamping, actually, you know, but I think that was like almost seven years ago. So, so, so if I understand, what you're thinking is that that the complaint was closed. Um, Complaint. In 2014, but open it back up, go through the process of dealing with the complaint, and then consider the reapplication. Yeah. Well, it, it was closed at the last meeting um, following denial of his reapplication. We had not received a response to the complaint. So we all didn't deny so, him. Right. So now it's he's appealing and he's submitted a response to the complaint. Right. Which and, and I think there's different approaches you could take. You could reopen the complaint, which I think is what you is what I, was I think so. Um, you know, or you could approve, just deny again, ask for an interview. So there's different options available. See, if you yeah. don't get his attention, then the, the mindset will be, and I'm just me talking. 
my sense is that, okay, let me just play the game. The next project I'm getting trouble, I just not renew. Really and then people forget about it, I reapply again. And I, and I agree with you because when I read the response back, and it was from, from his attorney, yeah. one of the things that they kept saying was, well, he didn't get paid, he didn't get paid. But yeah, that's the $10,000 sticking. You know, money. that's not that's not really a reason to not, I mean, when I keep hearing that repeated and repeated and repeated, and it seemed like it was like four or five times in that letter that, well, he didn't get paid, well, he didn't get paid, and I may be exaggerating, but uh, that's not a reason not to have your license in good shape and to, uh, to basically, and he kind of admitted, didn't he, that he stamped yeah. Or, or he submitted something that he, he probably shouldn't have. He said he was going to help us frame. Yeah. And so I think opening the complaint's a great way to just make it go through the rest of the process so that we can review it and adjudicate it like we do something that's got a you know, normal course of action. If, if that's possible, I think that's the right thing to do as well. When you open a complaint, we have to go to an informal report. So through the process of interview, we might find something that we know. So hold the reapplication as well. Yeah, yeah, I will not so do anything. And it's especially telling me, I said, because you were flying in 2014, and you understand that in 2014, we need to sign a document to renew your license. The board flagged because there was an open complaint. So in order for the board to be able to make a meaningful decision, the board or the committee needs to actually consider looking at a complaint. And through the informal process, we might discover something that we have not been told. Do we we need to make a motion and vote on so, all that? Yeah, I mean, it sounds like make, you would make a motion. And my motion is to reopen this complaint in 2014 and investigate it. I uh, currently put his application on hold and it there. Okay. All right. Is there a second? Yes, motion. Uh, this is my motion. I'll second. Okay. Is there any more discussion? Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Has it? Okay, uh, Robert uh, Hagenderger. Hagenderger, yes. Uh, so let's, a couple things about Hagenderger. His uh, undergraduate degree is in integrated mathematics. Um, he's got both a Master of Science and a PhD in engineering. Uh, he has five years experience after his Master of Science degree. Um, so here's the kind of the messed up thing about this. This is a comedy act. And correct me if I'm wrong, but for a comedy applicant, the order of which the that order doesn't matter. Uh, correct? I mean, so he could have, again, uh, just like we see in Kentucky and other states, he could have taken his test and then got his experience and then got licensed in Kentucky and it didn't matter. It wouldn't matter to us since it's a comedy application. And then go back to school and get another class or yeah, anything that, he wanted yeah, to do. Yeah. Right. But, uh, according to Dr. Smith, he meets his, even though his degree is in integrated mathematics, he's had enough uh, engineering courses to meet the NCWS standard. Uh, and, you know, that's something that we kind of use as our uh, bar, uh, is Dr. Smith's evaluation of the right. NCWS standard. So uh, my recommendation, again, if he were a, uh, if he were just a, red, a first time applicant, you know, then, then obviously that the experience thing has got a little bit, we spell that out a little bit more uh, closely. So, but since he's competent, there's no order in that, that I, and Dr. Smith is good. I, I make a recommendation that we approve his, uh, his application. I second. Okay. All and right. I want to read what I wrote here. He told, stole my notes. <laughs> Based on the timeline studying as an undergraduate, he meets our three legacy to E. Josh, yeah. Josh, yeah. And you use the word find out element analysis in his application. That's a plus. Um, okay, so we've got a motion and a second. Do we have more discussion? Okay, all in favor of approving Hagenberger for comedy, say aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. So approved. Okay, Robert. Uh, so the next one is a, is another one of those cases, and I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of go back to John just a little bit because we passed a rule or policy or something a few years ago about uh, this thing about transcripts and it was 
based on, and I didn't have it in front of me, I apologize, but um, it was based on people that could not get transcripts uh, because a, uh, the university they attended had been destroyed <coughs> during a declared uh, something, to whatever. Uh, can, can you, is that, am I paraphrasing yeah. it in the wrong yeah, way? Yeah, it was adopted in 2013, and if, if they're unable to obtain transcripts directly from the institution because the school's destroyed or for political reasons, whatever the case, then the policy says the board will consider requests to waive the requirement that they provide an original transcript issued by the institution. But when they do that, um, they have to submit like an affidavit explaining the circumstances, which I'm assuming that's, I haven't looked at it, but we've got that in the application. And then they can provide us with copies <coughs> That, um, of their transcripts that could then be evaluated by NCWS. Okay. So he actually had three, uh, this yeah. one right here, three, three, three original when he was in the country. He wanted to get it to sell it. So he went to, yeah, he was in school in Damascus, <coughs> uh, Syria. Uh, so hopefully we all have watched the news enough to know what Damascus, Syria probably looks like. Um, I don't think Paul's getting converted on the road there. But anyway, um, so kicking the goat, uh, uh, kicking the goat, G O E D, not the goat. But anyway, it. Um, so I think he probably meets that. He does have three. He says three originals that were uh, stamped uh, while he was over in Syria. Uh, but they basically have told him that they will not give him a send off. Here. He need to uh, try to find the same. Yeah, he said they, they said they won't send them uh, because it's too old and they don't keep up with it that uh, that for that long ago. Uh, so I think I think if he wants he signs the affidavit, we can send something. Uh, the transcript can be evaluated. I think I'm good with that. That we go ahead and recommend him for. Uh, to, to really, we're asking him to finalize the process, not necessarily. He still has to get it uh, uh, evaluated by NCWS, and he still has to. Right. He hasn't even applied yet. Right, right. right. So yeah, you're, you're just granting him yeah. a waiver to, from submitting okay. official so, transcripts. So, so, okay. So my, my recommendation would be to, to have a waiver for the original transcript, uh, as making sure that he fulfills the other requirements with the uh, affidavit, uh, and we might want to include include that rule, John. I don't know what else. It's just affidavit. Well, it's, it's a policy. Okay, policy. Is this what he said? Not the affidavit. Okay. Did he say? Oh, I, mean, I haven't looked at it. Page one hundred six. Okay, he does. I did not scroll at the bottom. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's got a notary and everything. Okay. I think we let him go ahead. So I make a motion that we let him waive the regional transcript. To allow him to continue on through the process of getting his transcript evaluated, uh, and then whatever happens, happens. That's okay. That's a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. okay. Any more discussion? Okay. All in favor of the motion, say aye. Aye. Uh, aye. Opposed. Motion passes. <clears throat> okay, Steve, go to Mr. Johnson. Joseph Johnson. Yes. It, the issue is whether he can count co op experience. And on his transcript, I don't see co op experience. And even in the letter from one of his professors, he only says he had one semester. But I think typically we've looked for that to be on the transcript to be approved. It has to be two semesters. At least two semesters. It has to be three, right? Yeah. Yeah. years experience. So three. He's a, I guess he's trying to claim some research experience too, although his letter didn't say that. But the the professor noted that he had done some undergraduate research for one of the professors. But I, I don't think it count 
can't just come up. It's not and he's, he's up. still very uh, way to. He's like 20, another couple more years. He was trying to get a one year experience so he can take the exam earlier. Graduated in May of 15. Right. So, yeah. and I, this is what I said. However, I mean, whatever he done in school, that's going to have his resume to get a real job. But I think to help him count the time to this, I have a good problem with it. Well, you know, UT and a lot of the other schools have a lot of a lot more opportunity for undergrad research participation, and I think it's great. I mean, I, I've seen the difference in the students who come out of those programs who participated in that undergrad research, and they, they have a name for it. It escapes me right now, but it's not the same as co-op. I mean, it's just it's not. It's hours per week. It's not a job. It's not 40 hours a week, and it's by no means equivalent. I, I would not agree with that. He says at the end, he says, we consider undergraduate research as an integral part of our curriculum similar to internships and co-ops. And it is similar to, but it is not equivalent, in my opinion. I agree with that. My comment was, if the registrar will write a letter saying that that was co-op experience, then good to go. Yeah, but, but they're not. But it was just one semester. And it, yeah, but I mean, no, the registrar co -op for one semester. would have to say that it's three years or it was co-op or whatever. Yeah. It's one semester of co-op, and then he wants the other stuff to count as the other two semesters. Okay. All right. Um, and I think you made a great point. I think it's a few hours a week, mm -hmm. you know, flipping papers up and down is different mm -hmm. than... It's good stuff. No doubt. It's good stuff, but it's not a job. Right. Probably help him get his job, his job, but I'm not going to help him take his license. Okay. So um, do we have a motion? Well, I don't see that that we should count that as a co-op experience. Okay. All that right. That would be my motion. Okay. Second. I say second. Okay. Any more discussion? All right. All in favor of denying the request, say aye. 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 Uh, all opposed. Okay. Motion passes. Next one is uh, Marlon Jacob yep. Lamb. Okay. His, his degree has been evaluated by Dr. Smith and meets the NCAA standard. When you consider, I guess he evaluated two degrees. His undergraduate degree is in what's called building construction. And then he earned his master's in civil. <coughs> he evaluated the combined degrees that met the the standard. I guess the question is, is that okay to to consider both degrees to meet the the standard, or does it have to be the undergraduate? Yeah, I've got a question about what we've done in the past. I, I know that we've had some applicants come before us for comedy that didn't have a bachelor's. Um, in engineering and so we rejected them because they didn't meet our state law but I don't re I don't remember whether Dr. Smith evaluated the, uh, everything they did to say that that was equivalent to a to the NCES education standard is that is that a difference in what we've done in the past I mean is that I think we have I mean, like a foreign. yeah it's no different than a foreign that, applicant that comes on a bit accredited right 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 that's they might call it something. Right, accreditation equivalency. So that, well, Dr. Smith noted that it met, met the NCAA yeah. standards. So. I think the word he used is marginal. Yeah, he did, but I mean, it, either it meets it yeah, or it doesn't. He did say marginally, but. He, he met it. He met it. Well, he met it. The thing that we need to remember that. Uh, like back to the foreign degree when people come see an undergraduate and they come into a graduate school. A lot of people do not meet the requirement of work. Back before the ACWS then it came out, AVAC was the criteria, EAC, EAC was the criteria. Or more stricter. Back those days, you don't have it, you don't have it. But I think that's how it was. Because they would get, get around that. So then I'm thinking that the pe people we've turned down before came to us with like a biology degree, bachelor's, master's in engineering. They were 
registered in another state and they're coming to us and they weren't equivalent. They, they, were they didn't have the equivalent. Okay, that's so right. that's the difference. Right. Okay. When you went back and looked at their undergrad and their grad together, they were still missing typically a capitalist based physics course is almost always Got it. what they end up So they missing. might. Is that right, John? Is yeah. That, yeah. So, yeah. so right. this person must have that. He had that as a, as a part there. of his okay. curriculum when he looked We got that on technology. Typically, it's a technology, technology degree. Right. They'll come in with a right. technology degree and maybe a master's or something. And right. They don't, they don't get close. But we learned too at the NCWS annual meeting, um, if it's an accredited master's degree, if they're, I'm sorry, if the, if the master's program is a EAC ABET accredited, then it will be, they said it will be equivalent to an undergraduate degree because as part of that program, they're required to go back and remedy any deficiencies right. in their in undergraduate order to, education. In order to get into that program? Yeah, I think, I think so, yeah. So it, I've got a question it does, and there's not a lot of on that, there's not a lot of accredited masters programs but those that are they said at the meeting that they would be equipped okay I've, I've got a question about that I, I, you know it's not an application question yeah. we don't, I don't, want to get I don't I'm not that. sure if Virginia Tech has an accredited masters program or not but okay Okay. And that could be the case and would explain why. It and is also, the criteria. Uh, this person, Lame, I think he's also applied for company. He's registered in a few states. So. Mm -hmm. Florida and uh, some of them. I mean, go back to what our premises for why protect the health, safety, welfare, public. He not mind. He might mind. The person quite, he can do the work and uh, don't have any complaint, I think. I don't lose a lot of sleep over this supposed to somebody's green and come to you know, have a ge geography degree but you can think that you have a right environment that you need. Yeah, good point. Good point. Okay, do we have a motion? I would make a motion that we accept his application for a common comedy based on Dr. Smith's recommendation. Okay. Second. All right. Any more discussion? All in favor of the motion say aye. Uh -huh. Opposed? Passes. Approved. Okay. Okay, Kathy Patterson. Is that you, Jason? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm so glad Welcome. we didn't say anything Welcome. disrespectful. <laughs> I didn't know if that was really Jason Patterson you were referring to. So okay. Yes, it is. It is. Well, welcome. Glad to have you here. Uh, I actually think that I was the one who was tasked with reviewing your application last time. So, uh, somewhat <coughs> apropos that I would get it this time also around. Uh, we had a question we were trying to discern from past history relative to what the rule was on, and correct me if I'm wrong, John, but working off memory, mm -hmm. that we asked for some guidance on what we had previously done, trying to be consistent on acquiring all of that experience prior to graduating with the ABET accredited degree and how that fulfilled the requirement for the experience right. portion. So do we have an answer on that? Yeah, on page 75 on your iPads. Is this but, under the engineering committee or where is this? Yeah, no, it's under the board meeting. Material. Under board meeting, not, okay. Yeah, so you'll have to go to a different document, sorry. I guess we could have put it in this package. Page 75? Yeah, it's and on that's page 75. Under, which is that under the reference materials or AE board? No, AE board. 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 Okay, okay. 75. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. Yeah, page 75. Okay. Yeah, we the, the issue is, well, first of all, the statute, as you know, doesn't address when the experience is, is obtained, whether it's before or after the qualifying degree, it just specifies that you have to have four years or more of progressive experience, et cetera. So it doesn't really specify if it's before graduation or after graduation. It's silent on that. The issue is with our rule, uh, rule 01201.10, paragraph two, the current rule um, has that last sentence states, um, this is on page 76, unless um, otherwise noted above an applicant's, and there it's referring to master's degrees and co-op programs, unless otherwise noted above an applicant's engineering experience must be obtained after graduation with a qualifying degree and completed by the date of the examination. 
So that language was added, you'll see, to the rule in 2008, although at that time it said prior to the date of application, and that was changed in 2011 to prior to the date of the examination. Wow, okay. But in 2008 is when that was added, that the experience had to be obtained after graduation. Okay. Prior to that, it was not in the rule. And in fact, back in 1980, the, tech, the, um, the rule specifically allowed um, progress experience prior to graduation to count. Like basically, uh, three years could count for one year of experience. So it, it was allowed to count. Now, it didn't count you know, one for one, but mm -hmm. it, it, did, it could be included in calculating their experience. So. So am I reading this right? So on page 77, 1980 text said, the board will grant toward the experience requirements, the four years of experience requirements, one year of credit for three years or more of certified progressive experience prior to graduation. Right, so it, it, that text only allowed like, up to one year credit for Experience prior before, to but you couldn't get that and get the co-op. Right, but not says not both. Right. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> so it did allow at least a portion of their experience to be prior to graduation, but that was removed in 1992 completely. Um, so you know, that's that's why in the past we have had applicants where the experience prior to graduation was, I'm sure, no doubt, counted because it wasn't prohibited. By the laws or rules. But the laws or rules changed in 2008. Yeah, I think currently the rules are pretty clear that experience has to be obtained after graduation. But I also. But rules could be changed before. So. But, but and this is the rule, not the law. Right. This is the rule, not the law. has no. Right. No word, no. Right, right. Uh, Mr. Chairman? Yes, Phil. What the board has done in the past, in my mind, that based on Mr. Patterson's application, if you follow what the standard for his progressive experience, the earliest date of taking the exam is April 2020. But because it's some experience, and then the board has able to grant up to six months non cooperative experience. I think it never gone, I don't believe really it never gone. But if it's a cooperative experience or practical experience, we had run them up to one year before. So, and, but then because somebody had, like, for example, somebody who's been a, work for an engineering firm, like Robert Campbell's firm, but like he knows the ins and out. He finally got his silver engineering degree, but he's been working about 20 years. The board has, in the past, considered that 20 years experience might give him six months to help him take the test. This is when people are very close to taking the exam. But even no matter what we do here to help Mr. Patterson, he still has the earliest in my mind. Again, my calculation could be wrong. It could be October 2019, we gave him six months credit. That's my thinking. You've just been looking at this longer than I have, so let me talk. Okay, I'm, l I'm a little confused. You, are you saying that you're equating that experience to like co-op experience, is no, that what you're saying? The typical way is that you, if you go you get a master's or get a co-op, you come one year, so you work three years the rest of the year, right. you take the exam. Okay. But in the past, there are cases where we come, this guy's been working for a long time, and then after 20 years, he got a bachelor's degree in civil engineering and electrical. And then he said, well, I'm six months short into taking the exam. Would the board consider all these 20 years my experience has to come towards the six months? And the board has done that before. So you're saying the board has, has in the past, exercised discretion for up to six months early. That's correct. But no more than that? No more. I don't remember any more than you haven't corrected me. Well, the, the question I have then is, is, did that happen before the rule change to say that the experience has to happen after graduation, that the board did that? Uh, or, or, and the same question is, does the board have the flexibility to do something different than the rule stated. I mean, I don't. No, unless you want to make a rule. Change. Unless you make a rule change. But then you. 
It wouldn't be effective until it would be effective. That, that would take longer than the four years of experience. Well, <laughs> you, Mr. Chairman, yes, sir. let me know when it's appropriate for me. To okay, I'm okay. Keep a muzzle on her. I understand. <laughs> I understand. I just. We're we're getting there. Yeah. yeah. And we appreciate it. I mean, I, I do think that that would be a rule change that would be um, looked favorably upon. Um, and that could be one we could put on our proposed rules rather than a rulemaking hearing because it doesn't seem to be too controversial if you're giving, you're expanding the opportunity instead of reducing it. Yeah. Here. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Kathy, you want to kind of round up the discussion or where do, where do we well I think we, number one I'd, I'd love to hear from Jason and so is it appropriate that we ask if that we have, since we have visitors that Jason have a chance to address the committee and then also that Howard have a chance or Harold that have a chance to address the committee would that be acceptable to the chair yes Jason don't be nervous you're amongst friends you really are actually yes I can just uh, imagine that <laughs> so one thing to precede this is I did have a degree in biology in 1996. So I did have a BS of a concentration in studied biology with English minor. Following that degree, I did some research. And after taking the GRE, decided not to go back to grad school, um, but instead began working for a company that Harold has started. Um, and that is where you found that I've been working approximately uh, 19 years this summer um, for Harold. The past 14 years, I have been working under a licensed engineer, primarily doing progressive engineering work. Um, and I have been uh, performing a lot. I've actually even managed some interns in the past. So I know I'm thankful you guys are even considering this because I know this is an unconventional situation. UT has a co-op program, but one of the requirements is that you be a full-time student. I could not be a full-time student. The best I could do is nine hours a semester while maintaining 40-hour work weeks. Um, however, in light of that, um, uh, I was hoping that perhaps that experience prior to the degree would be considered part of the co-op, which would be at the board's discretion of um, granting one year of experience. So your request is that we consider your experience while you were working at Canon and Canon as equivalent to the co-op one year's credit. Yes, ma'am. And we have that discretion, correct? It's not lit. It is co-op or equivalent? Yeah, I don't think that you're restricted there. It is co-op or equivalent. No, we have this question in there. That's, That's what I thought. I don't believe we have done more than six months. We don't. No, we should immediately decide. It just the rule just says experience obtained in an established cooperative education program, which is carried out within the framework of an approved engineering curriculum, and which has been approved by the board. So you just have to establish is it carried out within the framework of an approved engineering curriculum? Is it an established cooperative education that program? So that's the only requirement of the rule. Well, that, that and, and on that, and understand where that comes from. Yeah. That in this case too, and we just got in having this discussion three minutes ago, talking about the difference between doing research and co-op, right? Work. Versus real work, right. right? For which you get paid. For yes, and and I believe, uh, and Harold, you can speak to this. Uh, I know you're probably jumping up and down over there, so I'll get you in a minute. But. Uh, <laughs> uh, Jason has worked consistently normal work weeks, 30 plus hours a he's, week. He's exceeded in each year. I mean, but 30 hours is kind of our 2080. He was well over that every year. And you did pay him. <laughs> he did pay you. I did. Angie did. Angie That's did pay him. And he was overseen by other professional engineers doing tasks that would be. I mean, you've had co-ops in your business before. I've had them as well. Well, I'm not sure I've had them as well. I've had something resembling that. But anyway, um, there was structure. If he were a co, if it were a co-op program, 
I reckon the question is what difference would it make? Well, I did co-op. I co-op. I know what I'm saying is between the structured working in an environment for 30 or 40 hours a week or yeah. whatever versus what you would do three months at a time or one year at a time, taking a year off, year, yeah. that kind of thing. I, I don't know what the difference would be. Well, I, I mean, knowing what he was doing, having read through it, and understanding what the business model is, my observation would be that he absolutely was doing the equivalent of what I saw as a co-op. Might as well. When I yeah, was I think that's a key word. You said it, right, that as long as Louise, the comedian, establishes an equivalent to a co-op experience, the rule allows us up to one year. You know, that's I think I remember correctly that we have done this before for some other kid in uh, in uh, Memphis. I think he, he works for a long time for a company in Memphis for a long time. He, he came, I remember two persons came up here and we talked and finally he was only needing six months to take his exam. Now I think Jason, you're asking for, uh, Mr. Patterson, right? you're asking for one year so that you don't have to wait for the four years progressive experience. So that's why I say I calculated based on my number. If I give him six months, the earliest be October 2019. So if you give him one year, the earliest he can take is April 2019. Is that not correct? Why do you only want to give him six months? Back Just based on what I know in the past. Okay. There's when no do you, when are you trying to get approved? To what is your exam? request? What's your request? That's not in our paperwork. Well, initially. <laughs> you were trying for October? Yeah, this October. Okay. But, however, uh, understanding. Um, I, I would just ask the maximum discretion uh, right. experience okay. that the board would allow. Okay. I, I mean, I have uh, no doubt that Jason's ready to you know, take tests with that experience he's had. The question I've got is is just legally whether we are, or what, I mean, we don't want to make a decision that has to become undone. Um, because of legal reasons. Do we have the discretion to say that experience is equal to a co-op program? Because the rule, rule didn't say co-op or equal. I mean, it was pretty specific. It didn't say or equivalent, did it? It just, it just described a co-op program, which is a defined program, well, you know, Well, read that program. again, because I'm a little confused. Go ahead. Yeah, well, um, 0120-01-0.102. In general, progressive experience in the practice of engineering consists of engineering experience which is supervised by a registered professional engineer. The board may grant toward experience requirements for registration as an engineer one year of credit for graduation with a master's degree or higher in engineering from an approved curriculum or up to one year of qualified experience obtained in, a, in an established cooperative education program, which is carried out within the framework of an approved engineering curriculum, and which has been approved by the board. At least one year of engineering experience must be completed in the United States, unless otherwise noted above, an applicant's engineering experience must be obtained after graduation with a qualifying degree and completed by the date of the examination. So what we have to say is here, I mean, the words framework of a, of a uh, curriculum, right? I mean, it's, it doesn't say it has to be the co-op program. It says within the framework of that curriculum. And I would submit that 20 years under multiple PEs with the experience that is there would be under the framework of a qualified cooperative program without any doubt. I mean, the, the word, I think the word framework gives us a little bit of latitude because it doesn't say has to be from a university sponsored co-op. It says approved by the board. And I've read your stuff as well. And it's, you know, except for some of the people you were taking advice from during your career. Uh, I think it meets that, uh, uh, I think it meets that criteria. I mean, I think, you know, you do what I do, right? I mean, so it's... I thought you don't do anything at all. Well, I don't do anything back. Okay. I used to do this. Qualify that, man. Jason, don't get associated with it. Okay. Give him an opportunity to, yeah. to explain no, that. Mr. Chairman, I think it's an established program. I think it's consistent with what we've been a 
blind you. And so to answer Kathy's question, why did I pick, when I, my calculation lied late last night, I picked six months because that's based on my past experience. Because this individual needed six months to, to in order for him to take the test, so they're trying to bore him. Okay. So I'm okay with you. Whichever was the pleasure of the committee here. Mr. Cannon, do you want to speak to us? I'll be brief, which is out of character. And Robert smiles, he knows it's true. Uh, thank you all for letting us come today. Uh, the role you all have, I just rotated off six years of being in a similar seat in February, and so I understand what you have to put into this. And, uh, so for your service, thank you. And I'm not trying to suck up to this group, let me assure you. Uh, I also thought at the end of February, I wouldn't hear the word rule change anymore because I've had my fair share of them. Let me speak first on a broader sense, uh, more so on behalf of the profession. And that is, I respectfully would request the board to consider indeed pursuing a rule change. And if it follows in line with the rules that I had involved with, you're probably pushing the deadline for something to be implemented in the next year. I know that we typically had to consider a rule in November vote on it in January, there was a public notice, it then has to go to one other place, it doesn't come into effect until July, I don't know how I'm doing so far, but um, that July 1 is the earliest any rule change can take place. My reason for making that request is a lot of the reason that we're here about Jason, and that is the co-op co program was remarkable in my day. And then that was one of the first things that got cut by companies' budgets when things got tight. Uh, there also used to be in our universities evening courses where people could go and get their degree at night. Those have been cut by universities. And in fact, the co-op programs through the universities, as Jason has said, and rightly so, they require you to be a full-time student. And some of our best best and brightest and most mature people who are now in engineering have families that they have to take care of, like a Jason Patterson, like a Jonathan Holt. And so this framework, we're, we're boxed in as a profession, giving these folks opportunities. So that being said, and knowing that we will not change the university system of having, modifying their cooperative program at least for some time. I would ask that the board consider overall to pursue this rule change so that there's clarity. I'm a product of one of these variances. 35 years ago, I was before this group. Didn't know it, Kenny Wiggins was the same one. I don't think we have failed the state by having that year of, of gift, if you will, for our experience. And I think there's a lot more. <laughs> Make sure we're clear on the rule change that you yes, would propose. Um, what when you say we should um, um, have a rule change or, or, or proceed with one? What would be the rule change? I, I can't craft it. Or, or, not, but in general, in speaking, general. what you're having to do is make a decision today, and I think appropriately so based on the discussion that the work that has taken place is consistent with the intent of a cooperative program. It does not say with a university or anything like that, but just for future boards. It may be worth considering modifying that language so that there is no uh, having a discussion of equivalent. Robert, you said it best just a minute ago, uh, and in a lot fewer words. Um, that would just be a suggestion uh, that it clears it up. Is it is it um, is it that the experience would not have to follow graduation? It, would that that's be the, that's the recommendation? Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. That, so that's the first thing for, for one year or, or more than one max. Year. You know, I, I would love to see it for more than one year. I don't think it should be for any more than two. Okay. But that's not. I don't have an opinion there. I leave that. Well, but your your good input for us to know what you're thinking. I, you look at these folks who are working their way through school, providing for their family. Jason's numbers, every year he was over the 2080, and every year 
I had him send it to me while I was driving today. Every year, his work on rock solid billable engineering projects was somewhere between 96 and that 97 percent on average. And I think that's what this board wants to see. If that's, we aren't approving somebody who was a runner while they right. were, or, or running prints, if you will, or she is still such a thing, uh, you know, while they were while they were in school. You're wanting them to be under the super, I believe you want them to be under the supervision of a licensed professional engineer doing work associated with engineering. And so what you have said, I think, uh, as far as a consideration of a right. change takes any potential ambiguity out of that. That's number one. Number two, um, again, you all have said the best, and I won't repeat it. We did not, when, we, when Jason made the decision to go back to UT and get a Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering, I knew what my experience had been. I knew the credit that I had gotten. But we also knew, Angie and I both knew, things change. I'm old, okay, and things will change. So we very intentionally had Jason touch base with both the UT. That's when we found out that you had to be a full-time student. He's got kids, he's got a family, that didn't work. We also asked him to touch base with the board. I'm not saying anybody misspoke on behalf of the board. Please hear me on that. I am saying that the takeaway from that was is that all you have to do is turn in the experience when you make application to the board. If there had been anything different, quite frankly, I probably would have been talking to you all to say, how can what we do at Cannon and Cannon and any place else be an established cooperative education program, yeah. which is carried out within the framework of an improved engineering curriculum. Because quite frankly, I think that's what we do. When we have somebody going to school, that's what we are about. But if there's some stamp or some mark of approval we right. need, I promise you we would be about that. So that was the heart. That's the facts in the heart that went into the and that's why we didn't do anything else based on the feedback and the understanding that we received. Uh, I'll take the licks on that if any licks need to be given, but I think you know us well enough. We're, we're pretty protective of this profession. Uh, we're pretty dang up proud of it. And uh, I think what his experience has been, and frankly, another application he will get their experience will be, and other firms who are in the same boat, far exceeds, far exceeds what people will gain in a co-op program under a formal university setting. So, I, I, again, I appreciate you listening to way too many words for me, for your all concerns. Well, thank you for being here and giving us your thoughts. Appreciate it. Yeah. Um, okay, so... Kathy, what? yeah, uh, let, let me make. I like to make a couple of motions. Okay. Uh, n number one, I like to. Uh, I would like to note, just for the record, too, that if you go back to the 1980 text, uh, it, thank you, John and Liz, for putting together the history of the rule, and it talks about the fact that for every three years of certified, it says certified progressive experience prior to graduation uh, can count as a <coughs> year toward progressive experience. And I would just say, you know, who knew back then what did certified mean either? I mean, I think we're always grasping for uh, some type of legitimacy to the program. Uh, but if Jason came to us at this point in 1980 and asked, I think we would easily look at his three years plus experience with you and grant him the one year's experience. So I think also that was in 1980 and then it changed because co-ops became more in vogue and co-ops became a formal thing you could do and they were something that were sexy that colleges offered and they helped people get legitimate experience um, and then as you point out the reason I think co-ops have somewhat uh, slid back on the opportunity scale is because it costs money you, you got to be enrolled and you got to sign up for it and they give you credit for it and all this kind of stuff and so now it's going away. The pendulum swings, isn't it interesting? Uh, so my first, I've been wordy, but my first uh, 
motion would be that the board consider uh, or the committee make a recommendation to the board tomorrow to consider or Friday a change a rule change that would allow for granting of progressive experience on a and I think the one to three ratio is actually pretty good uh, because not everybody works full time more than 2,000 hours. Congratulations. Lack, Lord have mercy. Uh, I think you, could, you should only get, I don't, I don't think we should be in the business of offering two years experience before graduation plus the ability to get a year four masters and then all of a sudden we'll be allowing people to get registered with one year's practical experience and I just don't, I don't like that. So I would cap it at one year uh, but at a one to three ratio of experience progressive experience working under the tutelage of a licensed professional engineer while still in college. So I'd like to, I know I got wordy on that one too. Okay. Liz, you want to say that one? It's, it's your, the, that, Cause that's a rule issue. You want to put that in words that we might all agree on? I'm not sure that I got everything that you said in, in what I wrote down for your motion. Um, I had that you wanted to change rule, the rule to um, grant the progressive experience I think I lost you. I, I, can, take a, one I can take a stab at it. Three years prior to graduation. Yeah, basically we're reverting but, back to the 1980 text. Okay. Yeah, okay. I mean, yeah. The 1980 text says, uh, so here's my motion. The board be allowed the discretion to grant toward the experience requirements for registration up to one year of experience credit for each three years or more of progressive experience prior to graduation under the direct supervision of a licensed engineer. Are we saying the maximum of one year? Maximum of one year. And maybe the, in later years, we've added the language to graduation to say of the qualifying degree. Maybe we're just consistent That's with that. Fine. That's fine. And any other modifications that need to be made in order to make it fly through the rule change process. That's that. So that's my first motion. Anybody want to second that? Yes. So we have a, a second to that motion. Second. Okay. Any more discussion? Okay. All in. Uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. The, the only thing that how would the board be able to establish the, the documentation process? Is that a process? That's why I made it at the discretion of because the if you have it under the formal process, that is what the co-op is for. Right, co-op, at least you've got a transcript to go by. And then right now we have a process, if some of these degrees is not AVA equivalent, we have a process to, to go to Dr. Smith. But I think to keep the board clean, you and I may not, we are not probably not be around, I think we need that. Right. What is such a way where you need to document the process? Well, I think the, the, the process would be the progressive engineering experience, just like we all review. It's in the same form. Mm -hmm. the same the form. application and the references would help very well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just make sure that we have a process. Yeah. I like that. Though. So do we, that makes perfect sense. Do we add some words in there to no, just say that? Just, just, just in the main point. Okay. It'd be part of their application. Right. Be yeah, just the okay. Because it says at the board discretion. Mm -hmm. Chris, okay. Do we recognize Chris? If I can say something, I, I just want you to be aware that that would open the door to interns that are working while they're going to school. So just as long as you keep that in mind, because that's what we're doing at Lipscomb is, is suggesting that they get as many internships as possible, some of which extend through the, the academic year, where they're working 10 hours a week uh, for a company which I think is great experience and it's the same as co-op experience. So I'm not opposed to that. I just want you to be aware that it's opening the door to that. Well, that's a great point. But um, she, she's saying three years, so that's three years of full-time work. So if an intern totals up to that, then it, and it's under the supervision of a PE and it's progressive engineering experience if we count. The three to one ratio probably yeah, offers some right. protection on that. Mm -hmm. That's a good point though. And I would be okay with that because, frankly, I think the internship is, in many cases, equivalent to co-op experience. Yeah. 
that really brings up the fundamental thing is that it is the hero was talking about that we really need to start to when we meet with Dean the next time we need to bring this subject up about internship. Uh, I do know for a fact that uh, not many schools like UT have a co-op program. Like you go to University of Memphis, they don't have a co-op program, it's an internship program. Right. The most employee doesn't want a higher internship because they leave co-op you, you guarantee for three years. So we need to work through this. I think we probably need to get professionally involved and get help educated. To recognize the fact we're changing time now. Yeah. So between now and the December meeting, Legal can draft a rule change and we can send it out to you individually for feedback and you can individually send me back your own feedback on the rule change draft. Mm -hmm. And then we can um, add it to our list of proposed rules that the board will vote on in December and then those would move along through the process which is um, supposed to take nine months or less. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a rough timeline to look out for making a concrete change to this rule. Mm -hmm. So if we, quite question, if we approve Kathy's motion, mm -hmm. does that mean this will be presented to the board tomorrow as our rec recommendation? On Friday. It would be. I mean Friday. Yeah, yeah. yeah it would be. Part of your committee. Okay. This committee would bring it to the board um, that you would recommend this rule change and then the full board would vote that you want legal to Draft begin it. drafting okay. the rule change. Then okay. You would, you would then, get it ready for December. Right. And then December would be when you would vote to approve the actual language that we okay. um, all come up with. Okay. Great. Okay. So any more discussion about the motion? Okay. On the rule change only. On the rule, right, the one you made on the rule change. Okay, all in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, uh, opposed? Motion passes. Can, can I, after, before you say your second <laughs> So, that's fine on the rule change, but we may also want to consider the other ramifications of what all this is, which is basically what you've described is almost a decoupling. Mm -hmm. severe, yeah. Yes, I realize that. Okay, I'm, I'm just. No, I. We, I, we probably I, ought to think about some of this in terms of that, I, and maybe this is the intermediate step to that. I don't know, but uh, that that starts to go down. And again, I'm not opposed. I'm just saying that starts to move us in that direction. It is. It is fundamentally different. I mean, it is different from decoupling, though, because with decoupling that we've described, you still have to have four years of experience before you can become a PE. You can take the test after one year. And so the four years, have, the way our rules are now, have to come after graduation. If, if, we, if this changes, if this passes, and under the right circumstances, it can become three years after graduation. It's, it's still not decoupling. No, but it's... But it moves in. It's on the continuum. We're moving in that direction because the other reality is Jason could go to Kentucky tomorrow afternoon or whatever the test is and take the test. But he it, still can't get licensed. Anymore. But it wouldn't he could get licensed here, but he can get competency and move that, but he can move that process up a little bit because there's no order in competency. Mm -hmm. So, anyway. Yeah. Well, if... It, if Kentucky requires four years of experience, he could take the test, but he wouldn't be registered until after four years of right. experience. But, but Kentucky may not say for Kentucky may have it to where it says not after graduate four years of experience. I don't know what they say. You're right, right. I'm just saying that. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, we we, we don't know their rules, but if if their rules are like ours, we would have well, to wait. I think I just see it as we're creating a different path to registration. And you're absolutely right. This kind of makes what we're talking about, we think of it as one path, and I think your point is that it might be opening the door to three or four more paths. Which I'm okay with. Which is fine. But we just need but to understand to, that that, that broader discussion needs right. to happen. Right. Yeah. To think yeah. about those things. Yeah. Yes, I agree. I agree. Okay. Okay. All right. So, um, yeah, let, let me ask a point question. So, Jason, what um, I see on here that you graduated in 2015. December 15. December of 15. Okay, uh, December of 15. So in, in my example, then you would not be eligible 
if we gave you one year's credit, uh, then you would still not be eligible until December of 18, which really makes you sitting for the exam in the spring of 19. April. Yes, ma'am. Hate that. 3.3 years. Yeah. April yeah. 19 from graduation. Yeah. Yeah. He can stop paying you. <laughs> he can start paying you right now. <laughs> Just a suggestion. I, I do like that. You're right. I, 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 I like don't that. have to wait for you. that. See, I told you you're most friends. I'm trying to help you here. There we go. Yes. Angie, can you hear this? <laughs> Angie, said, nothing, nothing stopped me from paying you a little bit. No, I think, I think so. By the way, I want to say this is a good presentation to watch because I think that the board has always struggled with this is the way or no way, but I think the board is, I, in my mind, the committee usually pretty good about listening. And this over here to serve the profession. You don't want somebody to crack a check out there and try to make a man of the blue truck and try to, try to do some work and then get people killed. And it's not the case. No, we, we want, we, we do appreciate it. I mean, we, we need to see the quality. We want good people to be engineers in Tennessee. Um, we just have these rules that I guess we need, you know, we can't just do, uh, we have some framework to work under, so. Okay, so. Okay, we'll so uh, I have a question. My question for, uh, for the board to consider is whether or not the work that Jason has done, w without the rule change, in the absence of a rule change, because right now we don't have a rule change. Right. So in trying to get him to yes, which is my goal here, and how we get there, somehow or another, uh, does the board believe that his experience working at Cannon and Cannon prior to graduation constitutes equivalency as defined in the co-op paragraph of Rule 120.01.10? Does anyone have an opinion? I'm comfortable with that because he has nearly 20 years and if you look at his experience, he actually point was a crew chief and not exactly because I used to work survey code and exactly <coughs> and he has to make some good engineering judgments. So in my point of view, I'm very comfortable recommending that Mr. Passon be granted the one year to us his experience the equivalent, if I may use the word framework. To us right. the framework of a yes. yes. And like his earliest time for him to take the test be April twenty nineteen. I'm very comfortable. I'm just, yes, for me, this one. Does anyone feel that there should be more than one year's granted experience? I think there should be. But how do you do it? But, and and that's, that's the, the problem. Is there a mechanism? I'm exactly. I'm discussing some too. The problem is, for every super qualified person exactly. we have, we're going to have somebody, exactly. and I hate, to, I hate to try to legislate in that manner, but you end up with somebody you know, you mentioned it, somebody has 10 hours of an internship and they're going to try to spin that into three years worth of experience and it just gets to be befuddling at some point. And, and I don't want, so here's the deal and I think, again, I think we've talked, I would rather you, Jason, have to wait an extra year or two and I'm just to keep three people out that should be I mean, I, I, you know, I'm just speaking on what, what my opinion is, and I hate it, and I, but I don't see any other path going forward but the year. I just, uh, that would let us be consistent. Unless there's something that you all, I just don't see how well, from the rules, and even yeah, our law would let us. If I could step in, I think that it's okay for the board to be flexible with how you're interpreting framework of an approved engineering curriculum, but you can't really be flexible with up to one year. That's, yeah. that's where so, I am. I would, um, and that's what I'm saying. I don't see how. right here today. Yeah, because yeah. 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 I, because I, Jason, I mean, I think you're ready right now. I think I know what you've been doing for 17, 20 years, whatever it is. Uh, but I think we're, I think we're a little boxed in by the one year as a max of what we're kind of allowed to grant. Have we ever granted someone the opportunity to sit in October when their official four years is in December? December I don't know. Usually it's about the date of the exam. By the yeah. date of the exam. You yeah. have to have four by the date of the exam. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
rules gets changed, and let's say we get past the passage we have a legal, he can represent, reapply this case. He may not have to wait for 3.3 years, maybe less now, this one. So go ahead and take the box Yeah, I mean, if the, if, if the board votes and approves the rule change and it goes all the way through the process and say it becomes years. effective in next August or something, if he wants to. We yeah. Yeah, if it, if we can reconsider that if, if the rule is different. Yeah, if it goes through up to two years or something right, like that. Right, right. So in that case, you don't have to wait to April 2019. So the rules work in your favor now. So is it, uh, I guess a recommendation to me is to reapply for the October 2018 exam, which would be 2.9 years, and to um, request, I guess, for the board to <laughs> If the new rule comes up. But okay. for right now, you should be April 2019. Okay. I think I think right now we're going to go ahead and grant you the year's credit. Yeah. I mean, okay. we're, it was so that's my next motion is that I'd like to make a motion that we grant one year's progressive experience to Jason Patterson with regard to his prior to graduation progressive experience at Campbell okay. Camp. Under the Robert Campbell framework doctrine. <laughs> <laughs> Under the framework. I like it. Robert Campbell framework. Okay, that motion, do we have a second? Second that. Okay, any more discussion? Okay, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Sit. Motion so passes. So how's, how's the, you can input doing the rule change? Because we usually ask people. Thanks. But you're, you it's all <coughs> but based on today, if you just keep working, then you're automatically going to get approved for April of 19. You gotta get back at the. <laughs> <laughs> but you gotta keep working. Yeah. <laughs> 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 this is Do you have a job number for this? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, anyway, I appreciate your yeah. yeah. thought yeah. coming yeah. out of the yeah. We have all yeah. struggled with that. Three legs of Thank you so much. But you can get it done. Thank you for all the present, a lot of you here. And for allocating so much time to this discussion. This is. Thank you. I really appreciate this. Thank you. Thank you. He said it. Thank you. 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 you. all have a remarkable responsibility, and I'm glad that you all that are owning it. So thank you for all that you're doing. And I do mean that from the heart. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Carol, we appreciate it. Oh, tell Angie we appreciate it. I will do it. Thank you all for being Okay. Yeah. All right. What? What the point of inflection is? Point of inflection. Okay. All right. Next one. Mr. Wicker. Yeah. Um, Mr. Wicker. Yeah. Let's talk about Mr. Wicker right quick, and then we'll be done with him. Well, Sue is out there. Huh? Evening. Yeah, he's been walking up and down. Oh, is that him? Okay. I'm, I'm pretty sure. Oh, okay. Yeah, go I'm ahead. I'm pretty sure. Go ask him. Take him before he's I'm wondering if he was in there. Oh, the first guy. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry, we got that. We got the back and then go back. You'll get your for a okay. full hour and a half. Don't worry about it. Perfect. Perfect. How's everybody doing? Good, good, good. All right. Okay, do we want to we go with Mr. Sutton while he's here? Okay. Good afternoon. Can, can you pronounce your last name? It's uh, Struka. It's almost like an S T R U. Struka, okay. It's Polish. Got it. Okay. Fantastic. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a bit tricky one. My wife's still trying to learn. Okay. <laughs> All right, Philip. Philip, you had. Philip, you want to kind of. You want to. Do you want to lead the interview, or do you want to introduce ourselves? Huh? Oh, oh, like on, on our side? Yeah. Okay. No, no, we need to introduce ourselves. Let's yeah, introduce yeah. ourselves. All right. I'm I'm Ricky Bursai. Uh, I'm the West Tennessee engineer. Okay. Nice to meet you. And I'm Kathy Ware. I'm in the Middle Tennessee representation. Steve King, East Tennessee. Robert Campbell, East Tennessee. Philip <coughs> Lee, <coughs> West Tennessee. I'm one of the Phillips Indian Graphic Patients. Okay. Thanks, I'm the other one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I'm a. Yeah, I'm the Miller John and Liz. I'm John Coffin. I'm the board's executive director. I'm Liz Goldstein. I'm the board's 
And we just want to let you know that this is a public meeting, so it's being recorded, just so you're aware of that. Perfect. Okay. Okay, uh, Mr. Chairman, you want to read? Yeah, Philip, Philip, if you yeah, want to. Is that how you pronounce your name, Mr. Struka? Struka? It's like a S-T-R-U Thanks for coming, by the way. No, thank you for having me. When you, you submit an application that you wanted to take the exam for, for uh, a meeting, take the exam, and the time the board in August met and the meeting kind of had a question about your design experience. Mm -hmm. So I thought the best best way, and I recommend it to be to talk through a project. Yeah, well, Give us some example, and then we can ask you some questions. Yeah, why don't I just start off with uh, just the basics of what we do as far as the company. So what we are, with, uh, I work for Cornerstone Technical Group. Uh, we're in, in the industrial automation. Uh, we mainly deal with uh, industrial factories, uh, whether it be Bridgestone, Firestone, or something like McKee Foods. Um, so what we do is um, we have hardware that we can sell through by specifying to the customers. Uh, so we can sell individual pieces or we can sell a full-blown solution. What that entails is we have a customer that calls us and they want us to figure, they, wanna, they want to do something, whether it's to identify whether or not the leather in the car that they're about to produce, because when they produce cars, they kind of stage them in sections, whether it be uh, leather or cloth. They want to make sure the order of them. So they ask us, for example, how do we do that? They don't know how to do it, so they contact us and we provide them with the actual hardware. Some of it's pretty easy, kind of like that application. Uh, then it goes further along as uh, moving a part. So we want to move it, then at that point we determine how fast you want to move it, where it's moving to, what the load is. Um, so we'll determine that, whether it be a robot or like a linear actuator. Uh, sometimes it becomes a vision application where we use a vision to determine whether parts are there. Like on a keyboard, whether you have a QWERTY keyboard or some other keyboard, we, have, we don't really have humans looking at this because it's too fast, so will you implement vision? Uh, so if a customer doesn't know how to do that, they, they, they want to know how to do that, but they don't, they're either understaffed or don't have the ability to do it. At that point, we come in and we can either provide them with the actual pieces of hardware that does this, or take it a step further, uh, just because certain applications are a little bit more detail-oriented and actually need uh, more of an experiment, like vision. So what we'll do is we'll kind of build this in-house to whether verify whether it works or not. Uh, just because on a piece of paper with vision it kind of does, but you gotta verify it. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll build that in-house, uh, so we'll get all the hardware, we'll get all the pieces of equipment that the, or pieces of um, whatever it be from uh, the manufacturer or the company that wants us to solve this. And then we'll present to them and verify whether it works and then provide them with a hardware spec. Then at that point the customer determines whether or not they want to go an extra step. Sometimes they'll just buy the hardware, but sometimes they'll go ahead and further and then they'll buy the full solution. Well, we'll build the, the whole machine, uh, not a massive machine like millions and millions of dollars that you would imagine like a full-blown integrator does, but on a smaller scale, something that is uh, as big as maybe as this area right here that has multiple pieces of motors, drives, robots, or linear actuators. So when we build that, we can also provide technical support of everything that we do. So we all get phone calls from things that we build or sell and then we troubleshoot it throughout, whether it be via email, telephone, and sometimes it's, you can't do that, you actually have to go to the factory and fix it on the floor. But, so. Thank you, those are pretty good. Sounds like your company is kind of finding a solution to feel the pain for the customer. But what do you, what is your role in those processes? That pretty much what I described. So we're a very small company, um, on a much bigger company, I think I would be very selected onto the actual piece, but being a very smaller company, not a billion dollar company, I actually do all of it. Um, so I answer the phone call with the customer and talk to the customer and determine what I'll ask them briefly, because they don't know what to provide me. So they'll, I'll ask them certain questions to narrow it down for myself. At that point, 
what I'll do is I'll determine the actual hardware that goes with it. Um, whether it be, like I described, just the hardware. Then we also, when we have that whole team of where we build it, at that point, I'm part of that team as well. So we'll build it in-house for testing, but we'll also build it in order to sell it to the customer as a full machine. So I'm all three of those pieces. Uh, how, how do you make, me interrupt a second, how do you, how do you select the hardware? What's your, tell me how you go through selecting. So for instance, I want to put in a, uh, a parts conveyor uh, to take it between department A and department B. And I've got a vision sensor that, you know, starts the conveyor up because we, I've noticed there's something here and it goes. So how do you go about selecting, tell me, I want to do, I mean, tell me, tell me how you go about selecting the right hardware to meet that application. So we're, we're being a company that we represent other companies. We're like a vendor, think of it, because uh, we get a discount. We want to sell our product as well as you, because we're very discounted to make our profit as well, not just on the hardware, not on the services. Uh, so I kind of have an idea of where I need to lead him, because we don't typically sell outside of that. So I'll ask questions, for example, you know, what the distance is, uh, how fast is the conveyor moving, how fast are the parts moving. There are many parts scattered on the conveyor. Then at that point, we'll just measure it and determine based on the specifications that the vendor provides us from that vision system, we'll determine which actually falls into. Uh, so basically looking at specifications from the uh, data sheets, uh, sometimes it goes a little bit further than data sheets, but a lot of the information has to be provided to us just because certain cameras can't operate on that speed, so I have to rely on the information that the vendor provides us. So you're looking at also uh, motors as far as what horsepower rating you have? Yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll determine that and we have software that, you know, kind of helps us with the assistance of what, what type of a drive we need. But once again, as we still represent that company, now we still have to select out of thousands of part numbers, uh, you know, because certain applications fall in better than others. You don't want to, you know, a lot of customers will want bigger drives with higher amperage, but in the end, it might not suit for that application. So you gotta look at it, not only from the engineering side, but also what makes sense as far as price-wise. Because we can give them the biggest motor there is, but it's still not going to work for his application. And that happens quite a bit whenever a customer calls us and tells us of his application and provides a part number of the motor. And you can see whoever has done that work before has oversized it and upsold the customer. So we typically at that point explain to them what has happened um, and then provide them with the information that we have that better suit their application. I got a question. I, I think it's fantastic that you're applying to, that you want to be a PE and you're taking the exam. Um, a question I've got is, uh, it may not sound too appropriate, but why? I want to. I'd like to know why you you would like to be a PE. And I know I, I do design for buildings, and I can't do what I do if I'm not a PE because drawings have to have stamp on them to go into a code. Yeah. Authority. What What is your reason for? Um, multiple. I see. Uh, you know, a lot of it. I always wanted to be it. Okay. It's almost like you know, you're great. You're you want to grow. You never want to just stay in one spot. And I think after taking the FE, because in, in college, it wasn't, it was during a time where FE was kind of required, uh -huh. but then the following year, Tennessee Tech eliminated that. So at that point, I kind of was like, no, nobody really cares about the FE, it seems like. And then you start going to the real world, like, wait a minute, it actually does make sense okay. to come and go further. So that's why I took the FE and proceeded to go and thinking, well, it's time for me to grow even further to keep educating myself. Um, and only, not only that, but with, uh, with services, you know, you're providing services, so it makes sense to be a, a, a PE um, for what we do. Yep. You don't see it as much because it's an industrial automation, um, as, so you wouldn't see it as like a civil engineer or, you know, some of my buddies that work in like Oak Ridge where they actually have all of that done, uh, it's very different being in-house like that versus of what we do. But it's it's more of a personal goal. Okay, and it and it when you described your you know like your example job that you uh, that you went through it 
it sounds like the kind of thing where uh, I know with building designs, I don't think we've ever done two that are just alike or it's very no. rare. And they're and it sounds like what you're doing is each application is like a brand new problem to solve. Very much so. Okay. Very much so. They're, they still follow the idea, but you can't treat it. I mean, we've had applications where it worked at this facility, but never worked with RFID. I right. mean, it worked at one facility in Mexico, but never worked at Volkswagen in China. Right, right. So, I mean, you start getting into that where it doesn't really repeat itself, but you gain knowledge and say, well, wait a minute, you can't just, as you had somebody else, looked at it and said, oh, this is automatically it. Right. Without doing any type of a testing, you just kind of step back a little bit and go from there. Which, yep. Con in, in the integration, sounds like you like an integrator. You put everything on together. Is there any code or standard you can follow? So we do. Uh, a lot of these products that we represent already follow the code. Uh, so they are already specified based on that, the code that they're, the code whenever they're built, but yeah, we do still follow uh, the code, mainly is the, the safety code, which is 13849, uh, but a lot of it is still kind of, with industrial, it's still kind of different. Um, they still have to sign off within their own companies internally, so it's, uh, we do follow it, we, we obviously have to, but it's not when it comes down to like buildings, it's a, bit, a little bit different. Yeah. So the moment when you get your PE, are you saying in the future, when you put a system together, you have to put a stamp on it? I would like to, yes. But right now, you, you, you are not putting any stamp on it. You don't have to. There's no requirement. No, no requirement, because we, we can't, we don't, we can obviously right now, just because we don't have to, I don't, I'm not a PE, so we can't do that. Right. So who's this guy you work for, Andy? So Andy Benningfield, yes, yeah, so he is, uh, he was what, what, he had it lapsed, so I was work I worked underneath him. But once again, as it falls in where we're working on the industrial applications, it wasn't as needed, so he got kind of got it lapsed, um, and that that's where we created that issue. Is I worked for him, and then I had I worked for another PE that left to go to Alcoa actually. So you're here, here. Um, but um, so. Andy, what he does is he is the main person that comes down to the integration side. So he is, um, he actually worked for Bridgestone before as the main application and electrical engineer in-house over here. And uh, he was the design engineer for the Aiken plant before coming to us. He, has, he had his own company, we joined together and he provides the integration side where I work for him. Which exam are you planning to take? <laughs> I was looking at the uh, controls because that's what mine was when I did it in um, uh, uh, Tennessee Tech. But after looking through some of the examples, it's still more focused on the instrumentation rather than the actual controls that you would see in an industrial automation. Um, and honestly, there's not much material out there, so I was actually leaning towards maybe power. Just because it has uh, the rotary machines, even though it's still the smallest portion of the exam, so I I don't know honestly. That's kind of where I was looking at. You did power. We did, but it was you know being more focused on uh, the on controls. It was more of an introduction rather than uh, full you know full two semesters. And my senior design project was automation. I did RFID design. So talk me through the testing phase. When you test, what are some things you look for when you put a system together? How do you know it's not within specs and everything? Uh, can you clarify that again? Like for example, you put a system together. Okay, this is building, you put everything on together. And you go, you, what I heard is part of your job is to do testing. So what are you looking for in those testing process? So mainly on the, the actual, when it comes down to the vision one, um, vision is, we take our eyes for granted when it comes down to anything that deals with identifying colors or anything. And that's the biggest problem is we assume a lot. Um, so when we, we verify, when we first look at it and you know, go through the specification that it works, when we, when we actually build it, 
what we're looking for is um, shadow, you know, there could be a, a different issue with lighting. So we don't rely on lighting as far as the light fixtures, but we rely on our own internal sources that we provide. So whether it be a different color lighting, green, red, bright, strobing, not strobing, um, orientation of the part. So we're looking for, the, for that specific application portion of it. And uh, another thing is that you worry about is because you have to find out where it's going to be installed. So on a vision application, what you have is in this lab setting, it will work, but once you open the blinds and you take it maybe into a factory floor, you have external light. Now your shadow is, uh, is completely different. So then we kind of look into actually installing hoods around the actual uh, vision system. On the, whenever we do like the motion and drives, we, we, there's not much to that because it's already resolved during the process of the, using software or calculations. So that one's not so much. We typically automatically just build that solution and sell it to the customer um, because we'll add like like touch panels that we need, you know. So but so typically most of the ones that we physically build are um, are vision. Another one that we'll build is when it becomes. Uh, we do a lot of barcode applications, so think of like huge conveyor systems spitting out a lot of boxes, is whatever customer is kind of making it where it runs almost too fast for that application, so it's on the borderline. At that point, we'll once again test it on the distances whether or not it works. Uh, same thing with RFID. What we have done before is we build it inside, because RFID is always so tricky, we kind of give a little bit extra margin for that and then we'll just build it in-house and verify the distances. Uh, so that's the, that's the basics of it. Um, you can take it further down, but we pretty much eliminate that application when it, when it goes a little bit too much. So do having do all this, do you, do you in your mind believe that this is the engineering work or more of a work of a technician? Uh, I think it's both, uh, just because it's still more hands-on. Uh, than it needs to be, but I, I think it's both, honestly. Uh, and the reason I say that is also whenever I worked at Bridgestone, uh, you know, when you ask the whole work of a technician, I uh, when I worked there, we did, obviously I worked under the engineer and uh, uh, the main engineer that was for the plant, and he knew everything, and when it came down to certain things, we always wanted to get a little bit hands-on to understand a little bit more, and that was an issue is he always said, another engineer said, engineers don't do that, they don't get really dirty. Um, which, that, that was, I don't think that was accurate. Uh, I think you still need to have some sort of understanding. And the reason why I say that is not only because we're also working with uh, a lot of maintenance. So you have to kind of have the same lingo. Um, you're not talking to the same people that, with my job, I don't only talk to engineers that when we, we specify this project, but business partners, customer service, and then maintenance. So you kind of have to have a little bit of everything when it comes down to that, uh, even on the technician side, I, I, I think. Are you involved when it, uh, are you involved in programming? Uh, so you're using control panels and doing logic programming um, or what? Not as much. Uh, Andy, my uh, my supervisor, he's the one that mainly does that. Um, but I do a little bit of basic programming. Um, I mean, when it comes down to cert certain, you know, we have like PLC line, but ours is more of like remote I/O, so that means that the PLC logic is typically done on the other end. We just kind of like tether into it a little bit, so there's not much programming to be done. Um, and then not only that, with like barcodes, you can do certain settings, but it's not like programming that you would think like, you know, with Java or anything. That's typically what would have to be done would be through Andy because he's uh, Microsoft certified. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Do we, anybody, any other questions? Adam, I think just so you know kind of where the board's coming on a couple of these things is that when we reviewed your application and I was just refreshing myself with it yet four of your five references kind of came across as friends did is there anybody else that you've worked 
under the direct supervision of besides Andy. Andy's license lapsed, I guess you said that, which doesn't discredit him in what he says, but he was the one who was kind of the one person who had at least been a PE and vouched for you, and everybody else kind of came across as, one of them said, we're friends through our wives kind of a thing. Yeah, so there's actually two that work within the company, and that was Craig Maurer or John Maurer, that's only there. Initially, that's who I worked under. He was the active PE, and I was under the impression it was a lot longer until we started digging through our emails, and that's when I emailed Wanda, and I said, oh gosh, he's been active for only two months, and then went inactive. He went inactive, and he worked with the company with me for a lot longer at that point. So it was Andy and Craig or John, but the other two are my friends. The other ones are from my friends. The other, I have, honestly, I will tell you the truth. I have asked my Bridgestone Firestone plant engineer, and he said it was just too long because it was in college. Too far, too back. Too far back. Too far in the back. Yeah, and he felt like that was not adequate for what I was going for, which I totally understand because, I mean, it was 10 years ago, and it kind of says you had to have a PE after you graduated, so I wasn't sure about that. What's your title? Do you have a business card? What's your title? It's application engineer. Applications engineer. Okay. I do have a business card. No, no, I'm just curious. Yeah, we are. So in your industry, that's a title. We're just struggling because, you know, we just don't do what you do. Yeah. We're trying to understand in the arena in which you operate that that is indeed, you know, problem solving, defining the problem, applying engineering principles, you know, all the stuff that will make you a really good engineer, and we're just trying to see that. And so all these different perspectives that you give us help us to have a little bit more understanding and perceive the credibility of the work you've been doing. Right. Because that's what we're really kind of hung up on is the work. Of course, yeah. Yeah, I think that's an issue is just, you know, being in industrial automation, it is you won't see a lot of engineers there. A lot of them become, as you would say, technicians and convert to, you know, different terms of engineers as that term is, you know, used everywhere nowadays. You know, I mean, you go to a plant and everybody becomes an engineer one way or another. So with being on that end, you know, it's different. We're not the company that deals with the multi-billion dollar integration projects where, you know, they will take a whole project, build it for six months, assemble, you know, a whole conveyor system inside the fact, inside their house, disassemble it, and then sell it. We don't do that. We actually work with them. We don't want to compete with them because they would just destroy us because they're just so big. But they won't take projects that are hundreds of thousands of dollars because it's too small for them. But for us, it's adequate enough. It's good money, right. So because there's so many projects, and that's how we started. You know, we were just typically we would just sell hardware. And then it became where, especially with 2009, is whenever we noticed where it was so understaffed that nobody could do those small jobs that we are doing. That's why. So that's why I don't think you won't see as much as far as from the industrial world what we do as far as PEs because I don't think there's many in there because they go someplace else. Or they don't really go for that. They don't really see themselves going for PE because a lot of them are overworked. I've been and worked in a factory. You know, I mean, it just becomes where you're either thinking of a process in order to upgrade the project, but 90% of the time is you're trying to fix a problem because you never upgraded it. Right, right. So that's what we're trying to do is eliminate that where, hey, Mr. Customer, the stuff that you're dealing with is 15 years old. Have you considered this? Sure, let me talk to my business partner. That never goes through. Thank you. Anybody else? Well, 
Adam, we appreciate you being here. I think we need to need to discuss um, and go through it, but I um, appreciate you being here, and um, I think we have what we need. Do you have any to questions know. for us? Yeah. No, I do not. No. Okay, great. Thank you for having me, though. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, did, I don't know if I printed five copies. I didn't know how many to print of the explanation. I guess you had the yeah. and then resume. Yeah. Well, I, don't, I don't think we have a resume. I printed it out. Just give yeah, it. I'm not fully fine. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Because that will show you with Bridgestone, you know, not only did I do the uh, POC work, but I also did art flash studies. Uh, just because during that time, it was when um, a lot of companies needed to upgrade and put the stickers on of right. PPE to wear. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was in charge of that whole project and I did all that and then the PE would come in and sign off on it so um, and then so pretty much I think that's very updated uh, it kind of tells you but the explanation kind of tells you a little bit more about of what I do and kind of how I explained it today great thank you so thank you we thank applaud you. the fact that you want to get registered absolutely thank you yeah thank you all okay. right thank you that's it thank perfect thank you. Thank you. Thank All you. Right. Have a great day. You too. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, I, okay. first of all, I admire the working to get the, you know, this is the, exactly the industry that we struggle with. When all the man, manufacturer can see, people who work for Boeing to build an airplane, they're not certified. They're not PD, but yet they're building an yeah, airplane sure. that carries me all the way to Singapore and come back, you know. Yeah. But I think for him, he's a, he's a very small company. There's a group there in Memphis called the Industrial Automation Control Group, IAC. They struggle with things, having good people to work. The fact that he wants to take his company next level is good. Well, I understand <coughs> that he doesn't really do the nitty gritty about well, Ohm's law and all the things that he does. But again, he's more of a system integrator. I call him a system integrator. It means he puts the parts together. He's kind of like buying a computer, he buys a motherboard, he buy the you buy the power supply and you put them together, you test it out, if things don't work out, you gotta figure it out. So you got a good problem solving skill in my mind, I think. My my impression was uh, it makes me it makes me think of the structural engineer who worked in our in the same office suite as us used to call us catalog engineers. <laughs> you know, because uh, go to the catalog. That's it, that's yeah. right. That's all he go saw us doing is going to the catalog and picking the right product and like the engineer. Well, not so different than what he's doing and so I, I think you know what he's doing I mean we don't design the chiller and we don't design the controller that controls the chiller we put it together in a system that works to solve the problem and I think that's what he's doing yeah, he's, so I, he's I think in his world he's doing what we do is the way it hit me I like that he's responding well when I say do you think this is considered more engineering more than technician he said well we just yeah well. <laughs> yeah uh, do you need a motion for me? I, I, do we, I guess we can do do some more discussion. Do it. So I, that's all Greek to me. <laughs> a civil engineer. Yeah. And Robert, well, Robert, I mean, I was around a lot of that when we I was at Siemens, and um, it always comes back to me when I look at those industrial application type things. Are they solving problems? Yeah. I mean, that's, do you have a set of data? Are you using that to solve a problem? And I agree with you when you, there's the calculation part this week, and I would disagree just a little bit with you. You go, when you do it, you're going in and saying, okay, I've got this particular load, I've got this, you know, this airflow I've got to do. And you are kind of using, I mean, we do the same thing with pump stations, but we're still calculating. But we're doing calculations. We're, we're doing some calculations there. I'm not, that's the only part of it that I think is we, I, I think he solves the problem and I think he puts things together, which again, I think a really good engineer does is you, you know, put together a system, even a roadway's got a system, you got to have guardrail and pavement right. and, and lights and all that stuff. But uh, uh, the, the part that I think he is a little weak on is I think there's probably too much, I think this will work, let's go see what happens instead of a little bit more of a, and maybe there's not a good methodology, you know, maybe right. you say, 
A plus B really doesn't equal C because yeah. A and B together just don't, like he's talking about, you know, sometimes there's a shadow. Or he said that. Sometimes yeah. it doesn't work. Yeah, and so there's, there's almost that experimentation stuff that, now the good news is they're building stuff on a smaller scale that that experimentation stuff is probably not catastrophic, you know, because they can test it before they actually put it out on the street. Whereas if I'm designing a roadway and I've got the wrong degree of curve, the, the first test I get is when the motorist goes off the road, right? And because I didn't put the right curve in there, so right. So, um, whoopsie. Well, but I mean that's why we got more standards and stuff like that than Correct. a bigger project. Yeah, he he standards. doesn't have the standards. He doesn't have the standards. If we have. He does quote the safety standard. We shall please do. Yeah, yeah, that's right. right. I, I, said, I, I, I was too. I like that too. So I, I think I'm okay with it. Uh, again, I wish I heard a few more buzzword technical words. Do, do you think he did you say arc flash study? He did say arc flash study. As he walked out the door, I thought, oh yeah. I heard him say that. Do you think that <laughs> he uses the uh, engineering education that he got to perform his work? I, I think so. That's a good question. Yeah, because I think he's, question. he's talking about. I'm sure they're looking at motor, you know, what yeah. the motor is loaded at and what, uh, you know, they're doing at least some basic study where you say it's got to go this fast and we've got, and so I think they're probably doing the preliminary stuff with some yeah. schooling and then the rest of it's kind of an experimental thing. Um, no, I don't have any way to prove it, but I would tell you that he was struggling to take the power of the section. I can tell you right now. And the fact that he said that he's shying away from controls because you smart enough to figure to take the easiest way. You might might should actually take computer. Because you do a lot of computer integration. I think it's gonna take him a couple of times before he passes. Yeah. That, like you said, he's gonna to have to find something yeah. that Because he's fishing and, and that's right. the fact that he wants to be a, a better engineer he keeps saying gonna educate crew of me. But I tell you when you take power system based on and I'll take a look at his transcript. I'm a professor so No, I understand I look at the transcript. He had really yeah. Well, taking it a couple times is not the end of the world. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, it's happens. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, um, are we? I tell my students, half is for finished, is for extinction. You know. Hopefully, two times is not possible. <laughs> are we? Are we ready to move on? Yeah. 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 Are we ready to make a motion? Yeah. Let's make a motion. Got okay. a motion. We approve him to take the exam. Okay. Second. Provide. I know. Seen this. Provide. I think he may have He's got okay. everything. He's got it. Okay. All right. Uh, we get. We have a second. Any other conversation? All right, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay. No, just a general comment. I think we need to, as a board, we need to try to Wanda's reach out to this group of people. Have to reach out to all these hard things. I think he left. Maybe we can have some meeting, like go to town hall meeting. What? Well, haven't we just kind of sent an email or letter in the past? Yeah. I think yeah. Right, let's do that. Don't talk like that. G. So run him down. <laughs> He's gone uh, in the parking lot. I guarantee you send me. She's gone uh, Okay. Alright, I think we got one more. Um Yeah, Kathy, you can take us through Mr. Wicker. And if you can remember. <laughs> I thought I was trying to move it along here. Hey, I can be impeached at any time. Replaced. I can we don't want to impeach you. We just want you to hurry up. I'm trying. I'm, I thought I was cutting that short. You have all the stress. We just want you to move it. It's these next topics I'm scared of. Oh, okay. All right. So, so here's the deal. This is Bryant Wickert. And... We sent his his transcripts to, to Dr. Smith, who came back and said that he was 16 hours deficient in engineering science and engineering design, and the chemistry course he took was distance learning and should not be accepted. So he responded, and he's, he has quite a few emails and letters and, and has tried to make the, the case, and, and I think that's what we're here to discuss is uh, what side of the judgment do we fall down on? But he's trying to make the case that his master's degree, let me make sure I get this right. Yeah, his master's degree is uh, was evaluated to determine if he had all of the engineering prerequisites to get into the master's program. 
and they found they the master's program that he attended found that he had appropriately completed all of the engineering classes that he needed as an undergrad in order to be a part of this master's program. If you turn to page 185 on the engineering applications handout, this is where Dr. Smith <coughs> is uh, breakdown. So under 32 college semester credit hours of math and science, he says two hours deficient plus no chemistry. The chemistry was completed via distance learning, which is not acceptable under board policy. Is that correct, that distance learning is not allowed? I was not aware of that. What, and I did see in the, the a letter from Mr. Wigard important. where he said he did not He's see exactly it. Exactly the same. He, he didn't see it in the rules. I wouldn't make an exception to it. Is distance learning not allowed? Which, which rule is it? It'd be point 10, I guess. Yeah, the I, don't I don't understand yeah, why it wouldn't be allowed to be. No, I, I don't either. Yeah, I don't no. There's a lot of engineering either. degrees that do distance learning, so I don't understand why that right. would not be. No, they're, it's not they're, specifically mentioned as a, yeah. as it not being allowed in our rules. There was a provision at one time that um, if the degree was, uh, if a degree was entirely online, 100 percent online, that it wasn't deemed acceptable, but we struck that because ABET does accredit 100% online programs now. Mm -hmm. right. There's not very many, right. but there's a handful. But they're out there, sure. So, so maybe that's, that's what the, that, where that confusion is So we, we from. do need to make Dr. Smith aware of the fact that that's not necessarily true, because yeah. apparently, because he wrote it right here. It says, chemistry was completed via distance learning, which is not acceptable under board policy. Yeah. So we need to make sure that he understands that that's not true, right. that he can't accept that in the future. And then general education was fine. And then 48 college semester credit hours, engineering science and engineering design. Undergraduate was zero, and graduate was 32 hours. So he finds him to be 16 hours deficient on the credit hours for engineering science and engineering design. So based on the above criteria, the academic program does not meet the, the minimum NCWS criteria would not be recommended for acceptance. However, there's more. So, if you turn to the next page, and you're, you have a letter from the uh, University of Illinois Champaign, which is a pretty darn good engineering school, I think. That's yeah. what I've always heard. And so they go on to say, this is from the, uh, a professor of engineering at that school, please allow me to introduce myself. Our engineering students are required to complete this and equivalent to that. And for architecture students who apply to our joint master's program, we accept the above two architecture courses. Now, one of Dr. Smith's comments is that an engineering degree is required to be taught by an engineering professor. And that these degrees were architectural courses taught by architectural professors. And that's why he disallowed them. Mm -hmm. However, the University of Illinois is saying, no, from our perspective, they are the same. Prerequisite courses in two of our architecture courses are similar in content to courses for engineering students in statics, dynamics, and mechanics of materials, which are the ones that, are, that he's missing. And at the graduate level, similar engineering courses, et cetera, et cetera, I'm not reading to you. But their position is he met their requirements for undergrad education before they would allow him to take the master's program and then went on to pass the engineering master's program, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, I went through this in a little bit more detail last time when I saw it the last time, and I'm open for discussion. I have an wow. opinion, but I think it's a little more discussion. This is tough. Yes. You, you want to input on something? Yes, input. I, I, I agree with what the, the investigation, the review that Kathy has presented, I thought was pretty concise. I can certainly accept the chemistry courses. First of all, I, I want to say this. In my mind, there's no question that this applicant can perform the job to be applied for a the license of separate states. Okay? Exactly. That is not a question of me whether he can do it. The thing that I could not get over is how do we overcome 16 hours yeah. of deficiency? And the board, the committee has always been very consistent in making people back to take courses. Yeah. So in my goodness and my heart, which I have some goodness to Robert, okay? 
he can go ahead and maybe take four additional basic sciences courses to let him take the distant learning and then fulfill it. So that when somebody stick a microphone in front of me, why be exception to this guy and not be exception to me? If I don't, we have to be consistent. Back to that, I wanted to like, one of the E, three legged students. So, I mean, I hate to keep bringing in, but it's the three E's that really kind of jack me all the time. You know? So, but I thought he had all those education requirements. I didn't think he had, I thought. Dr. Smith did not believe that because those uh, 16 hours of the graduate school he added only had 32 hours, but he needed 16 hours. Uh, yeah, well, that 48, 48, so he needed 16, 16 more. Efficient. I thought that's what the It's in the engineering science and okay. engineering design. So that wasn't the chemistry thing? No, no, no. Okay. chemistry, okay. chemistry okay. I can wait. I think it's a no-brainer. Oh, okay. yeah. okay. It's the, the 16 engineering sciences, and I think in the past what we did not we do, we asked the African to go back and take courses, and get those courses approved by Dr. Smith, and he take it. Uh, if you take each engineering course, science course is three hours, so if you take four courses, 12 hours, at least maybe we can make a section. I don't know. I just couldn't get, put my hands around, yeah. around the, the education. 16 hours. I have a real problem with that. I, I, yeah, I, I think that this, this guy is a great student also. I mean, if you look at his transcript, this guy is making great grades. The hang up seems to be that Dr. Smith wants him to have taken engineering classes taught by engineering faculty. And in the program that they have it set up, and again, it's a really good school. It's this is, and it's not a distance degree. It's a really good school. That their classes for undergraduate just happen to be they have an A in front of them instead of an E in front of the number, and they are taught by architectural faculty. But it's with the intent that it meet the same learning objectives, and that those people then go on to the master's program. That's the whole intent of the program, and asking him to go back and repeat some very low-level <coughs> engineering classes after he's already got a master's and he's been practicing and he's, I mean, this is a comedy application. This is not, is, is he prepared to sit for the exam? The man obviously knows what he's doing already. Mm. Yeah, I think he's... Has, has Dr. Smith seen this letter that uh, the Illinois professors sent that makes the case that the courses are the same? He has seen that letter. I have a real hard time. I mean, Dr. Smith is our judge of what is accepted or what's yeah. equivalent. Now, however, now correct me if I'm wrong on this. We have cases sent it to EAC, which is now NCWA. Okay. I said, take a look at it. Get a second look at it. Well, it's already in here, right? Is this, am I looking at the right one? Yeah, he's already got the yeah. NCAA. He's got the NCAA. Yeah, got the NCAA. Yeah, got the they say it was equivalent. Yeah, they they say did say that. Yep. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Where, what page is that on? Uh, his application starts at about 210. So they say it was equivalent. Yeah, 199. Why did we have Dr. Smith? Okay. Was that requested at the last meeting? I don't know. I think it was asked for request. With the Dr. What Smith evaluation. Yeah. Okay. I'm trying to think because I do that before. I can't remember if it was before the meeting. Haven't we had others where we've just we've taken the NCES evaluation? Yeah, I mean, because they use the same criteria, so. But not from that the last meeting, okay. But normally, if it's a domestic degree, Dr. Smith evaluates it. If it's foreign, NCWS evaluates it. Okay. But we do have domestic applicants who maybe for other states have gone through NCWS. Okay, I'm, I'm stupid. His evaluation wasn't done until August 26th. That was after. Yeah. The by, who? by Dr. Smith? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. If you go, you know, that was after. Where, where you go, under it? engineer applications, page 199. Okay. All right, page 199, engineer applications. This is the, the very, this is the page where it does credentials evaluation. Okay. Comparability summary, outcome, equivalent. Mm -hmm. Deficiency none. Yeah, I would say they are that architectural Correct. courses. Yeah. Outcome equivalent. I see. But they use the same criteria. Obviously, Dr. Smith uses the CWS criteria. He just came to a different conclusion than they did. 
That's correct. So, so the classes are just efficient on engineering and science the classes, right? They're, the, they're a structures classes that were taught by an architectural professor instead of an engineer. So, so I, I mean, again, I just can't get over this. Uh, I mean, I'm making a motion. I would make a motion to approve him because he has been approved by NCAAS, which I thought that was right. But when I start looking over here, he's looking at composite materials. Uh, he's doing studies on different type of concrete uh, reinforcement. You, you start looking at his experience. The on seventy story buildings. <laughs> uh, and, and, and I look at that and I go, uh, and, he's, and, he's, and he's doing it with seismic and wind loads. He's not doing it in a, he's doing it in China and Florida, different places that have those kind of code requirements. And I'm looking at it going, what what going what's going back to school and taking a, uh, a statics class statics class or taking a uh, material a mechanics materials class or something like that going to do for him? I mean, he's that's what he's doing right here. Uh, you know, I mean, clarifying locations of beam columns, braces, and project locations of slab edges. I mean, help you're getting out the slab edges to me. Where are you going to get that in the college class? Yeah. Well, I, I, I think that to cut Dr. Smith some slack, I think that and he, I'm not trying he, to get on him. I'm yeah, right. he just reviewed it literally to the letter of the law. And the letter of the law says that they have to be engineering courses taught by engineering faculty. And when he evaluated it, it was architectural courses taught by architectural faculty. Therefore, it didn't, it was not, quote, equivalent. But, I think this board has the discretion to look at the fact that NCWS has already judged the outcome of his degree as being equivalent, and we should see that likewise. You, Mr. Dr. Smith said she, he always has said that it is only my recommendation. It's only his board recommendation. Can okay. Make That's right. Exception to the rule. But back to what we talk about. If we had, I put what my notes is. It's just we just need to be able to put put my hands around the education. If you someone want to tell me that he's the NCWS is the equivalent of now, okay, he took Cal 1 and Cal 2, and Cal 3, I barely passed Cal 3, I mean, I think it's good. Yeah. You mm -hmm. believe I barely passed my Cal 2? Did you really? Yeah. Barely make it. I'm lying. <laughs> I'm going to lie to you once in a while. So I, I think that in my mind, once if somebody says, why do you approach this guy? And this guy comes out, so why? guess what? We got a criteria. I got something to base my decision on. Right? I mean, you got an NCAA thing. Plus, right. you got an experience record that you don't have on some other people. Right. We, ready so make, we ready to make a motion? I make a motion we approve. A second. Second. Any more discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Good job. Okay. Wow. They, that's all of them on the have list. To go find some more bananas. Okay. That is all. <laughs> okay. Moving on. Moving on. Thank God we don't have the organized dinner plans. So. Uh, no. Uh, well, I do. I'm celebrating my birthday. Yeah. 20 of my friends are meeting. That's right. What time? Yeah, so what time? Hopefully, I won't. Where are they you going? better get going. Where are they going? What restaurant? Uh, Las Palmas. Don't get a mark. Oh, Margarita. Six o'clock. What? Well, I probably won't be there until like 6.30, but they're going to be there. Oh, my gosh. We, we need to hurry. We need to hurry. No, you don't, you don't need to hurry. No, the thing is, another thing is, we can actually meet first thing in the morning, too. We got to hurry. No, unless you have announced it. Yeah, we can announce it. It's just, okay. around the corner. You know, I'm a rookie at this, so it's whatever. We can get, we can get through some of this pretty fast. It's all Let's get there. I just it's, didn't want to show up it. after the party. I mean, some of the things we can, I'm if we need more discussion, the, the music can always That's my role. Before the next meeting. Yes, sir. Okay, are, are we on potential law, rule, and policy changes? Well, yes. Can I make a quick motion? Uh, absolutely. Quick, uh, let's get this observers for ABET a thing out of the way. Okay. Uh, if you want to do your report for NCWS, because that may lead us into some of the rule changes. Okay. Stuff. That's a great idea. So we get, get the observers. These things. Yeah, go ahead and do the observer thing. We should be able to knock this out pretty quick. Okay, um, so for MTSU is this week. I don't think there's any way we can send any money to that one. Um, <laughs> Indians is October 22nd through the 24th, and Ricky Bursai had indicated he might could attend that one. So I, I mean, I, I can if any, unless, 
No one else was clamoring for it. Nobody was. Right. Is that you're me? Right. That's good. Yeah. All right. So your union and for UT Knoxville, <laughs> it's October 29th through the 31st. And who is that? Who would you say? UT Knoxville. UT Knoxville. Yeah. Well, uh, and I'm on the civil engineering department. Oh, okay. You can't go. You can't go. Uh, well, fill it with this term being expired might not be the best oh, idea. Oh. I don't know what the law is saying. But well, but no one's appointed to fill his slot. Yeah. Are you still? Might be. Yeah, I mean, it might be advisable to send someone else. But but, I mean, again, this is an observer role. You're not taking an active. It's not. Right. You know, they may ask you a question or two. I think it's let's let. I mean, Phil wants to go. Let him. I'm gone the entire month of October. I'm not going to see myself. But I mean, you know, until we have somebody officially yeah. placed, right? Sure. If for some reason he gets replaced before this comes up, mm -hmm. we could rediscuss. Yeah. Or I, I don't know if the question. school would even I'm care at that point. I mean, yeah. I've got a question about that because, I mean, I've received a letter and a certificate. That says, I, you know, it's the my appointment is at immediate or whatever as the West Tennessee board member. But I didn't. But I figured you you guys should know, <laughs> be told it shouldn't be like me. So he doesn't know. That's why I call him. I say, well, we, I they need. don't. Tell. They don't tell you. Yeah, they don't. So I have to tell you. <laughs> I mean, they do eventually, but yeah. it's yeah. not simultaneous with when you're. In the but yeah. Laura Rago would even know that she was not appointed to be. So, I mean, I don't know. I mean, here's the I think we could go ahead and let Phillip go yeah. be a representative of the board, whether he's on the board or not, because, I mean, they're not asking us to take any of the. I've been to those things. Yeah. I'm a boring. That's making me feel good. <laughs> yeah, and I think and I think any questions they would have, how does the board do this or how the board does that? I don't think there's any. I mean, going to give a great yeah. answer. Anybody with 72 years of experience on that? <laughs> That's right. Yeah. 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 Philip is the best. But just just to let you know, though, I mean, if he's I know. as far as travel reimbursement, yeah. he'll stay with his. Make all those you can provide that if you're you no longer. Can't provide that, then Robert will give you twenty dollars. My son didn't mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, he's so you're good. Yeah. Okay. He's, he wants to go. All right. He just want to make sure. I'll buy you breakfast tomorrow. But the board don't pay for all this travel, right? right? The board don't pay for all this money. Even if it's for. Well, I mean, we have done reimbursement in the past, like for mileage expenses and stuff. So, okay. Yeah, we have. But, you're just gonna lose a little gas money. If you're on the board, yeah. <laughs> you is that okay with you? But you may be. You may be you What's the date on that, John? Oh, for union? Yes. Yeah. Uh, no, for no, Knox. Knoxville, October 29th through the 31st. But so, so since Ricky, so that Ricky's not associated anymore. Have they appointed an associate member? Oh no. So technically not, not speaking, this will be my last meeting, correct? Not that I know. Go ahead, tell me. Yes, it's my last meeting. <laughs> well, yeah, if he's been appointed to your position. But you may be the associate. Could be. But I haven't gotten a note. No, no, no. I, I haven't, mean, I haven't heard I've been home. I've been here all this week. I've got no one this week. You felt that. But I still think you're okay. I thought. You go. Casey, I'm bored of coffee. Yes. Okay. Okay. Casey liked my three ladies. So I will notify the team chairs, and then they will contact you. Okay. About that union. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. John, I'm reading you all your face. If you think this cost one cost you two plus and I just remove my name, it's okay. <laughs> Seriously, I mean. No. Okay. All right, I'll go. Ahead. I think whether he's again whether he's on the board or not, what he's doing over there. Yeah. And you can easily report back to the board if there's any issues. I mean it's, right. you know, you know you know the ins and outs and it's not an official capacity. No, I was a pretty one the one the Philip and I was speak to me after when I finished the board. Uh -oh. Oh. <laughs> All right, NCWS annual meeting. Okay, annual meeting. Okay. That, that's on page 72. I mean, it's a written report. So Thank you, Nick. We don't have to go through it necessarily. Oh, my God. <laughs> Y'all could just read it. But the, the motion to change the, the voting where states would have like two votes versus one per member board, that failed. So happy to report that that failed. 
Uh, we are having a combined regional meeting in 2020. That one passed. Yay. So thank you for supporting that. Um, and they did amend the position statement on future education requirements for engineering licensure for the practice-oriented pathway. Um, any other comments, questions about the annual meeting? Um, Ricky, let's not be hanging. Absolutely. Yes, I, I think it was also interesting to note that uh, because of the North Carolina dental decision, uh, many, many boards are under various types of uh, regulatory reform, even to the point of uh, hostility, I would say, if I read the, uh, several of the or heard several of the people. Uh, trying to take responsibility away from them, trying to um, remove certain things uh, from them. And I thought that was very interesting uh, to hear at that meeting. So, yeah, I got the, the impression that Tennessee, is, whether it's by luck or by foresight, is set up pretty well as far as you know being appointed by the governor and being underneath the gov government agency all is where the other people are kind of needing to move to the other states. And we'll see how this new law is played out. Whether that's exactly right. Okay. All right. Any, is that it on the <coughs> okay annual meeting report? Mm -hmm. Now we go back to potential law, rule, and policy changes. Page six. And the first one on page six is adding definitions of practice. This is under the meeting materials. Definitions of practice and incidental practice to the law, which has come up before. This is not the first time this has appeared on the agenda. And I believe Mr. Versailles is the one who asked for this to be on the agenda. So we'll let you lead that discussion. Okay, yeah, I can, I can state why. Um, so we're talking about, yeah, definition of the practice. And um, the, the thing that keeps coming up in, in um, the, the complaint cases that we review or that, that I have looked at is the, you know, architects doing engineering and engineers doing architecture. And it continues to come up. And, the, and um, so if there were, if, if, if we had the, the definition of the practice in there where it said engineers can only do incidental architecture and architects can only do incidental engineering, that would, it would take care of a lot of that. Um, I have, but I have this, you know, I know, I know Robert's, um, views expressed in the past about not having a definition and I, and I totally, you know, that's the esteem for, for Robert's view is for me, um, really high and he's got history on the board of that, you know, of that coming into play for decades so um, so I, I, I'm good however the board wants to look at this I just know in reviewing complaint cases if there 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 would be uh, some advantages to having the practice defined and then the other thing is I guess we're the only state that doesn't is that right that we're the only right, state we are. Yeah. Um, so I, that feels kind of funny um, just saying that but uh, maybe we're the I mean if there if the advantages to not having it defined outweigh uh, the disadvantages to not having it defined I'm, I'm totally open to that and just so you know the architect committee discussed it and they did vote to uh, you know make make a motion to pursue a, a legislative change to define the practice of architecture so they're, they're okay they're fully supportive of trying to define the practice well, I have always thought since my first involvement with TSPE back in the early 80s that there should be a definition, but I don't, I don't think a definition is going to help you. 
in, in your situation because when you read these definitions, they're so general, mm -hmm. I don't think it helps a bit. Where I think it helps is not with professions that this board has, that we, we regulate, it's the other professions, surveying, uh, geology, that sort of try to <clears throat> weave their way into civil engineering. My experience. That's where I think it helps us, and I think those all have definitions. So here we're we're hanging out here with this, especially in civil engineering, this big broad practice. Then we we have other uh, licensees from other boards that kind of try to weasel in on it. Well, why would it not help when I'm talking? Because when, when there's if a, you read the definitions, they're, they're so general. That okay. I don't think I don't think you could take these definitions and say. Well, what, Mr. Engineer, what you did on this building project is really architecture, because they're both so general. Hard to believe. So, I, and I haven't, or lately I haven't. But so, if there is a, if there is a uh, an engineering sheet uh, that has a mechanical stamp on, or mechanical in the title, you know, mechanical plan. And it's piping plan and an architect stamps it. Having a definition would not help that, you know, be able to say that's not incidental engineering. If the, if the definition said architecture can include incidental engineering, then kind of a description of that. Well, the, the good thing about it, the reason it, it doesn't bother me to have a definition because this board is going to decide what's incidental and what's not. I just don't, I don't think it. We're still going to be back. Did that engineer or architect were they competent to do? You see, right now we don't have an incidental phrase in anything. Well, we, but we don't have any definition. Right. I'm saying an architect can absolutely do all the engineering if, if they are, if if they have uh, can say that they're competent and we agree. That's right. That right now, and and but, I think how many times I think you? that's something left over. From 50 years ago, yeah, and it is not right now generally in the best interest of the. But how many times and you've reviewed just as many of these, or more, maybe more than I have? But yeah. you get a set of plans that one registrant stamps everything. Yeah, you can you can tell even without knowing whether they're an engineer or an architect. What, what they can do and what they can't do. Yeah, I would just spend a lot less time if, <laughs> if there was a rule there <laughs> that said you can't do it. But I agree but, with you. But there, I, there, I are, do agree. there are some there are some people that probably can, you know, in varying degrees. <clears throat> I think, I think... Maybe not everything. Again, I think way. it's left over from 50 years ago and those people are dying out. There's, I, a, there's a, a guy in Knoxville, an engineer, that does a lot of building stuff that Probably a lot of architects would say he can't do it, yeah. but he does. Because he, he does good, some good with it. Yeah. So, yeah. so what comes around goes around, I reckon, right? And, and what I see a definition doing is you talked about what we did 50 years ago. Well, 50 years ago, you had uh, kind of what uh, Mr. Struka uh, had. You had a lot of engineers that were doing engineer slash technical work. You know, they were they were doing concrete mixed designs kind of on the fly because we didn't have a lot of data to say what would work or, or they were out there doing uh, uh, analysis of tipping over with cars because again we didn't have some of that and then we started getting segmented because we had codes and we had things and so you had a civil engineer doing civil engineer and you had a mechanical and, and it was pretty narrow. Now you've got this program at MTSU called Bio not by what's it called, Megatronics. 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 Yeah. So we've got an electrical and mechanical thing that are together. Um, we've got other things. My, and, and the reason this has kind of hit me a little bit more is my son's going to look, start looking at colleges and, and he's kind of looking at something that lets him almost tailor his own degree uh, to, to a certain extent. He wants a little bit of this, a little bit of this, a little bit of this, a little bit of this. And engineering is becoming that. Engineering is becoming a a little bit of software, a little bit of math, a little bit of material science, a little bit of this. And 
that, and again, I think we're coming back to what it was 50, 70, 100 years ago where the way that everything's progressing, the lines are so blurred within the engineering community and within other things that to give a definition of engineering and a definition of this, I, I, I just, I think we're going to be short-sighted going into the future. The other thing that it worries me, based on what I've heard just uh, earlier in that meeting, so this architect in Knoxville that, or this engineer that's doing architectural stuff, you know what he has to say? Restraint of trade. Do what? Restraint of trade. Say that again. A restraint, restraint. of trade. Oh, okay, okay. Right? You're limiting somebody's ability to earn a living when True. they are capable of doing that by definition. And, and, and I just don't know that we want to get ourselves in that kind of, I think we as a board have enough, jurors, enough leeway to say you can't do it or you can't do it. I think on the edges we're always going to have arguments, don't matter the incidental, non-incidental. Right. Um, I, I'm just not sure that we're going to, and, and I really wonder how many across the nation have architects and engineers on the same board. John, do you kind of have an idea? I mean, there's, there's quite a few joint boards, but I don't know what the percentage is. Exactly. I wouldn't know. Maybe, yeah. I mean, I, I would, I would, 15. I would say that a lot of those boards, a lot of those definitions are set up because you had separate boards that were always in arguments with each other. And, you know, we have to kind of face each other in this board. So, uh, I mean, that's, that's my opinion. That's not the gospel. It's just my Yeah, opinion. no, that, that great point that, the, the the thing that is that seems doesn't doesn't really make sense to me is to to go into all of this all of this information about what people have to have in their curriculum to get an engineering degree and and we we look with such scrutiny at the at the degree to be an engineer and to do engineering work and then we can let an architect do engineering work in Tennessee if they say they're capable and you know I mean it that that just doesn't doesn't make sense to me that we we could look at such scrutiny about giving somebody a PE and then somebody who doesn't have a PE can do engineering work um, the other thing about restraint of trade is true uh, the thing that I would say is when, when all other when the other 49 states have definitions of engineering it would be hard for me to mount a strong case that we are would be restraining trade um, as compared to the rest of the country when you know none of the, none of the other all the others have defined engineering. Um, so I think it's just uh, again a great topic to discuss at this meeting. Well, I, um, I would like to bring this topic to my chief counsel as well because it's. It's interesting to me because before the North Carolina Dental Bill came out, I remember conversations with my legal management saying that the board should really look into finding a definition that they agree on for their profession. And so now with that recent bill, maybe it's shied us away, but okay. I'd kind of like to talk with them and get their evaluation of whether or not they think this is a good move too so that I could bring back um, you know, some advice for you guys on this topic. I think all of the concerns are very legitimate, um, but with all the other states having definitions, I don't think Tennessee would be singled out in a negative manner here. And, and, I, and I, I, I think that would be a great idea to, to know what, what legal thing, what direction would they really see, like to see this go? Um, and I, again, we can work it. We can work it like we have been, and I and I totally respect all those reasons. You're not hurt my feelings. Well. No, I I'm, just think that we've not had one, and it's worked fairly well. It has. Well, the, the but I will say that, that the I hear it from practitioners, yeah. other professionals that I work with, who it doesn't make sense. And, and I think if nothing else, I'm at least expressing what I think some of our registrants think and that needs to be aired. What we see wouldn't want to happen is for the architects to get a definition and the engineers not have one. I 
with that would be. They would. They kind of go together. <clears throat> Uh, and I've suggested when, when I was in here in the architect's meeting embedded in most of their meetings. <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty obvious they weren't getting anywhere without some leadership. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's on the record. It's and Frank, that's on the record. You heard it. <laughs> uh, but I think if we're going if I think that we all need to get together and talk about that. If they're gonna have one, we're not, vice versa. Uh, we need to put a stake in the ground between the two groups, not just have one group go out and you know run off into the sunset with their definition and us not do it. Um, and then I still, I think, Elizabeth, that's a great idea. Find yeah. out kind of what the ins and outs are because you know I, I don't know. Well, it it would be good. It's just the next page over to take a look at the the, the definition of architecture and the definition. The engineering is right under it. From yeah. from NCES. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you don't have to now. But yeah. yeah. Well. Solid. Okay. It, it, it's very yeah, general. The, um, the architecture board had some language from the states that they preferred. Um, obviously, if we do draft a definition for uh, this committee. We could we could look at some of your preferences as well. Like all of it does get reviewed by the different yeah. levels of legal management too for their input. So we we would have forty nine to look at. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, that's what everybody does. They <laughs> start with that, this is just these small the definitions and then revise it and go from there. Yeah. Some of them define incidental practice of. Yeah. Right. Which, I, which could be easy. Yeah. Alabama. Yeah. Does. yeah I have seen that. I have seen that. Yeah. Yeah. I think Florida does too. And some of them say what is not. Yeah, I, the following is excluded from. Right. Right. Okay. All right. That why don't we end that conversation there and say you're gonna find out about yes, what I legal things about. Yes. I will put that on my action items. Okay. Yes. What else? All right. So next, anything? under rule changes, there's yes. this continuing education rule changes, which. Uh, I think many of you have been in the previous committees discussing those. I don't know if you need me to run through those for the engineers. Again, it was what we discussed in August, so we changed a few things. Where is that? So it's on page 27 is the rulemaking hearing notice draft. I, th I think the big things are we're phasing out the uh, carryover, carryover hours. hours. Phasing those out in 2021, right? And, and we're giving engineers the option it's an option of obtaining hours on a calendar year basis. So those are the two main changes for y'all. And just as I repeat for those who were not in that committee, we split the basic requirement rules into paragraphs that contain the different professions instead of having separate rules. And that was just to keep the consistency of all of our other forms and publications and <coughs> references that um, make a reference to to this rule just to keep the consistency okay all right what up, is that it well and then under questions on rules these came from the state fire marshal's office i wasn't sure where to put these so i put them here as they regard rules um, your interpretation of rules uh, one question from the state fire marshal's office regarded uh, whether registrants should be required to sell change orders addenda and field changes not, not plans and specs, but specifically change orders, addenda, and field changes. The architects discussed that one, and they couldn't reach a consensus on that. But the second one regarding trust designs, this is back on page six, by the way. The second one, they, they felt pretty strongly that, yeah, the trust designers need to seal their designs. They don't need them. What page, what page is this? This is on page six. Page six. Yeah. The trust designers definitely need to seal their work. I've got a question. I mean, why would an engineer stamp a change order? Because change orders are produced by contractors. Why, why are you asking me? <laughs> <laughs> this I wanted, is a question for I wanted to chime in on that in the architect Can't, meeting and didn't. <laughs> I'm going to say it's against the law for me to stamp a change order because I didn't produce the change order. Well, but you, you looked it over. Well, uh, we well, should have can, a rule that says all change orders need to be stamped because. <laughs> Uh, a change order could increase the cost for whatever reason, and the design didn't change. Right. It could it could 
increase or decrease the amount of contract time that a contractor has to perform a certain thing, and that has nothing to do with the design. change order is not a design. I mean, but it could be not not but by there, definition. Yeah, you, you could you could come across something in the in construction that required a change in the design. Sure. No, no, that that, that, that needs that's to be. a yeah, the engineer would stamp the revision. Right. right. But a change order right. is. Right. is a um, cost it's document. A it's, a, document. A, it's a financial document. Right. Yeah, I mean, that right. is produced by a contractor, so it's not appropriate for a design professional to stamp that. Well, maybe, I mean, the State Fire Marshal's Office kind of gave their initial thought. Yeah. If a document directs a change to planned construction and the change order or, or ASI is presented in a document type that must be prepared by a Tennessee registered licensee, then that document should be sealed. Okay. Then I, I don't think they're, I think the words are wrong. I don't think they're using change order. I think the revision to request a change or, or a request for change order is, is what they're talking about. Rick, Ricky, if you read really into what he said on yeah. page six, it says, if a document directs a change to planned construction and the change order for ASI is presented in a document type that must be prepared by a Tennessee registered licensee, then that document should be sealed. So if it is a document type, meaning a plan change, mm -hmm. a yeah. design change, then that obviously does have to be signed by a registered engineer. Yeah, I just want him to add a word in front of the change order there. Those two places he used that needs to be right. request for change order. Required. Or, or RC. Design change. I mean, it has to be something that's not. RC ever decided in front of that. Request change for change order. order. Itself, it's change not. order, when I'm thinking about it, it's like you go out there and you are like, you need to change it because it's just about 5000 dollars more here and there, the kind of thing. Contractor, they want to make some change, change order. Change. Yeah, that needs another word. I mean, I understand then what it, what they're asking, and that's fine. It's just the word needs to be correct. The phrase um, it needs to say a request for change order. Typically, we would stamp an addendum. That's another thing you mentioned, but I guess not not every addendum in the world. Modifies a design, but it, it could. Yeah, uh, it, could, it could just be something from our purchasing department that says this this word was left out. Or yeah, we're changing the date. Of the yeah, day. yeah, we're we're extending the bid date by a month. Or yeah, and you see addendum that are not that are that are issued by purchasing departments and not issued by engineers that have no stamp on. Them. I mean, I think. I think the only time we really need to stamp an addendum is if you, again, I think the word design is important. If it's something that materially impacts the design, yeah. you know, you're changing out a component or a something, I think that might be uh, something that you would do. Okay. All right. And as far as the trust design, do you agree with the inclusion of the architect committee there? The trust that is the engineer of record review stamp good enough, or does it have to be signed? Sealed. That's what I would say. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you just whoever designed it, they designed it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. They got to have yeah. engineers on staff. Yes. Yeah. Well, they shouldn't be freaking doing it. Yeah. <laughs> well, they, I mean, they just put it in. They put it in a trust something program. In a software package, yeah, yeah. and it spits so out the size. Well, of a lot of yeah. structural yeah. engineers put things in the software package. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so that's a yes on trust designer stamping. Okay. Okay. What else? The architect, architect committee, it, it sort of seemed like some of the architects were thinking that just because a structural engineer did some structural work on a building, even though they didn't do the trust design, that they ought to stamp that too. Well, that's not right. No, and, and, they, and they were saying the same thing. That? Yeah, but they were saying the same thing. Frankly, you know, we got a structural engineer that so he wouldn't stamp it. Well, he didn't do the work. He, he didn't do the work, so he shouldn't stamp it. Right. I mean, and, he, and he was right. So I think that's absolutely right. The the person that did the trust design needs to stamp right. it. Yeah. Not the uh, okay. And usually it's with a, a vendor. Okay. Right. right. And they design need they right. need to have a registered PE in our state to do that. Yeah. Okay. 
you know, I think a lot of these companies don't, and so they'll have they'll ask a Tennessee registrant to review it and see what's what's happening. Ah, yeah. Okay. All right. So that's it for those. Okay. All rule changes. Questions <laughs> today. Questions there. Okay. Uh, let's see. We're down to. Application references? Yeah, I think the last meeting y'all had asked for that to be added to the agenda, I think partly to review the reference form oh, to okay. ensure that it provided you with the information that you needed. That's terrible. That's on, you might want to just defer this to the next meeting. Yeah, that one. That's on page 73 is the, is the current reference form that we use. But I, I, I think that was the thinking behind it. I could drone on endlessly about my displeasure with that with that form. So I think, yeah, I think that one that is a. If um, board members individually have suggestions, you can send them to us before the next meeting, so that we don't always have to wait months in between to tweak things. I mean, of course, to, the whole board has to vote on a, a change that we would utilize. But yeah. if you individually have some suggestions feel free to send them to John or I in between right. And that goes for most anything. Yeah. And I think we modified this, what, four or five Three, years ago? Yes. Yeah, it's, like it. it's been a few years how, since we've looked how, at it. How awful. Yeah. Oh, that yeah. explains how awful it is. How was it? It's changed. <laughs> well, I, I think I made a comment. Yeah, you're right. I made a comment on last meeting because we, we continue to to quest it give us the information to, we really to have want. questions yeah, about what did this person do that was engineering that meets our criteria and and we continually aren't getting and I don't know if it's possible but well the big thing that we did with this was that we made the person go back and validate the experiences the applicant had listed down okay forward they could right. they didn't see that okay right. So they were just saying, hey, they did this, this, and guy. this, and the applicant was saying, I did this, this, and this, and we didn't know if they ever would. That's so that was kind of the big change for this. Okay. Um, and I think we took some other forms that, that and tried to get some other questions that other states had put in there. You know, this thing about the relationship, what, you know, we got a lot of them said I'm a friend I'm or friend, a coworker, or yeah. knowing they were a supervisor or something. So I think there's some stuff in here that there was a reason for that, but I agree. I don't think I don't think we're getting the real uh, a real reference for some of these things. I think it's just kind of a check mark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna get this done. Come on, I'm up there really putting a lot of time into it, which is a professions problem, not yeah. not uh, or that, uh, a forms problem. Yeah. Well, why don't we why don't we leave it where we we all look at the form and if we've got okay. suggestions we send. Yeah. Okay. Then we can discuss in December again. Okay. Send it between can, between. Can I ask then. another follow up type thing for that? These things that we're going to kind of look at and do stuff. Can we get like a board do this before the next meeting? Thing? Yeah, I'll um, take a look at all the items that I've well, written down. Well, I work better on today. <laughs> well, that's what our action uh, item list is intended. I know, but I don't get it till. Yeah, I know. We I uh, good point. It out I'd, be, I'd be happy yeah. to send out a list of what um, the board has directed legal to uh, draft and edit. Or something that you need time. our input on. Yeah, like yeah. that you want us to do. If you send that out, you know, a week or two after the meeting, I can put yeah. that in my thing and go, okay, I need to answer this. Right. I need to do mm -hmm. that. I need to do this because. But we get it the week before, a few days before, which is understood. But but right. you've got this other stuff you're going through too, and it's hard to put. I mean, if you think right. about it or have some time, anyway. That's yeah, I can, yeah. I, yeah, I can do that. The okay. PE honeydew list. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <I'll go through laughs> All right. It's on here for Okay. Um, we're ready to move on to unfinished business. Electronic seals and signatures requirements. What do we? Um, it's the Robert so. Nothing really is going on, although Will Reed thinks it's uh, under control, evidently. So, uh, anyway. <laughs> you actually talked about it last week. And, uh, yeah. And the DSBA. DSBA. Yeah. So, it's kind of hard, yeah. yeah, I think that the, uh, I think TDOT's still looking at what exactly what software methodology, et cetera. Uh, we're all kind of on the same page with that with the Florida, the way Florida's doing it. Okay. Uh, and, and we're open to looking at different things. And again, once we solve this, 
the issue of model uh, signatures is going to come along at some point in the future, which we had a, you know about Bitcoin, and it was a good thing that that the uh, Miami meeting, the guy talked about that a little while, so uh, there's a lot of other things that will be part of this, but just keep it on here, John. I don't know if there's anything we need to do. I think we'll have a proposal brought to us or a, hey, is this okay kind of thing, and we may have to change our rules a little bit. Uh, to, to do that, but I mean, it will it won't be imminent. It'll have to be something that goes to the normal flow of things, uh, because there's nothing to go change it to, and we just be kind of yeah. stabbing in the dark right now. Yeah. Okay. And I will mention you you mentioned this, Robert. Yeah. I think in a yeah. this is really good it's article I agree. Yeah. about yeah. it just yeah. but it really says what the difference between electronic signature and a digital signature is. And this is the number one question that I get from people. And I think when we do this rule change, I think if we put a little bit of language in there, a little bit more that says the difference between the two, it would be good. We, we might help help people on that. Or if they could have gone to town hall meeting, I could explain <laughs> That's right. Everybody. So there's 15 people in the state of Tennessee that know exactly. They know what exactly what it is. Okay. All right. Anything else on electronic seals? Okay. Decoupling. What are we got on decoupling? I don't know. Any updates? On no, I think it's pretty quiet. Uh, the profession is still. What's the will of the profession right now? We have um, we have a task force or a you know small ad hoc committee, if you will, um, that is beginning to come together. Uh, that is representative of several different groups um, and includes uh, includes additional people who um, want to look at the broader sort of licensing issue with it. Um, you know, as, if we're going to discuss these coupling, we'd like to discuss kind of the master's degree and all of that stuff to have a broader licensing discussion. And so uh, TSB uh, is inviting people to participate in that group and they will likely get started. Can I ask a question? Since we rely on what's been talked today about looking at the experience basis, don't you think we fall right into this group looking into it? I'm just not trying to create more work for you. No, I took a lot of notes on that because I think it's I think they want to look at really the broader discussion because I think it's all part of part of the understanding. So you can bring that up today. Yeah. If any of you would like to participate, let me know. When I'm not on the board, I can participate now. Sign you up. My wife will kill me. Mm -hmm. She said, I need to be tired. <laughs> okay. Casey, All right. Casey I, just as feedback, I would say, and I know, I know some in the community probably understand this, but, but I would encourage you to express to them a sense of urgency much more so than they have exhibited in the past couple of years. I think that's the reason for the I mean, engineers in general, we're slow about doing these things. Um, but if they don't want to have a decision placed upon them, they need to get on. Correct. And if they try to broaden the whole, well, let's look at this. And I let's think look it's at just that. the representatives sitting at the table who there are a few people who need, who, uh, need to be heard to not to hopefully feel better, if that is fair. No, it's fine. Uh, I mean, everybody should be heard that y'all are not, that you don't think that that there will be anything in the governor's in the administration no, package, not correct? That I know, not yeah. that we've been talking. Okay. Yeah. I just haven't had a chance to talk to Carter about yeah. it yet. Um, but that's my thought is that we have something to, uh, some ideas to bring back to you all uh, fairly quickly to consider. It. Well, it, you know, what, I don't think there's a very large population of engineers who know that the legislation passed last spring about the exemption for an engineering technology degree. I think that's going to filter out there. And if we make this change, you mean master's oh, you degree. The master's I'm sorry, the master's degree. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that seems like I'm sorry. I'm one of them. <laughs> and then once, if we consider this rule change on three years yeah. of internship, et cetera, it counts toward suddenly everybody that wants to hurry up and get registered is going to start coming out of the woodwork. That's, that's just what I, 
I'm just looking in the crystal ball and I could be wrong, but that's just what I'm thinking is going to happen. And once people start deciding that they want to go to their legislator and get some legislation passed for them, for their child, for their career, I, I, you're, the, the industry is going to lose control of the discussion. That's why I'm saying show a sense of urgency. Well, and I think that, that that's part of that discussion about bringing the couple of people into that mix who do know about that bill because that legislation sunsets the same time that we would bring a decoupling bill. You know, the, the, the timing of that mm -hmm. would make some sense. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not saying that we'll change any of that, I, or, or offer a change of any of that, but right. I, I think it's the people who are already, the people who legislators have said, this guy's calling me, you right. handle it, uh, right. I'm inviting them to <coughs> express it, because you know, yeah. I think that's a more productive way to engage them in the discussion. Well, I know that you know, we're all somewhat conservative in our industry, has a tendency to be quiet until stirred up. and. They need to just understand the message that if they want to, if they want to be in control of the discussion about their industry, then they need to be in control about the discussion of their industry and not not just wait. I, I, I worry about the, these one-offs that come before the board and people who are find legislative activists on their behalf who are willing to carry their water. That's not good legislation. That's not good for the citizenry. It's certainly not good for the safety, safety health, and welfare of the, of the state. Then I know I'm preaching to the choir, but I've got to, I just feel a need to preach a little because I, I just want the industry groups that should be representing their constituency need to they need to wake up a little and be have a little more sense of urgency on this topic. I, I think ASCE is is awake. They just can't decide what they want to do. Well, I'm sure that's <laughs> true. I so mean, yeah, there's, there, I. We keep bashing it around and it just cannot come to a consensus. Um, it is. When Chris, what I told them, and I, you know, I talked to them. I, I wasn't in, I didn't hear, I don't think what you want to say. Well, I mean, I just told them, I said two things. I said, first of all, there are no, you're not going to do a cost-benefit analysis on this and get it. Okay? <laughs> they're, they're, you're just not. You're not going to look at it and say, here are the good things, here are the bad things. Um, I said, because they're equal. I mean, you can make a point, counterpoint for every good and bad and, and all that stuff. So I said, I don't think you're going to see that. Um, and I said, so you have to, <coughs> to Kathy's point, you have to almost look at this from a, I don't know that it's going to make, let's put together what would be the best, a better solution because if not, it gets something forced upon us that becomes more problematic than anything that we want to deal with. And, and I told them that too. I said, well, this thing is determined at a legislative level that harms us. And I said, understand the board's not going to do a thing. That's right. We're, we're, we are, and I, I mean, for a lot of different reasons, we don't, put forth a lot of legislation. You know, I mean, if we're here to kind of adjudicate some of that stuff, it's difficult for us also to write the legislation that does that. I mean, from an ethics standpoint, that gets a little a little dicey. So we're looking at the societies to tell us what direction, sponsor the legislation, make it work, and then we'll say, yeah, that, that's really great, or hey, we've got this little deal with it or something. But she's exactly right. We're in a climate where if we do nothing, what's going to get in there is you're going to have uh, kangaroos from Mars taking, you know, being eligible for the test or something, and it's not going to be a, it's not going to be a pleasant. Then we have to go fight it tooth and nail rather than say this is what we want. And that's just not a good place to be in all the time. That's Every once in a while, I would also like to, I, I would, I would hope that. Um, that we can have a proactive discussion with the administrative side, you know, the administration side of this, and the the attorney side and the board, except you know, just to make sure that every that it, gosh, it's easier to all be on the same page. And that's certainly where we where we've approached it, yeah, for years exactly that. And okay. I know there, but that there's not consensus. Chris, I mean, I, I understand that. If there was, that'd be real easy. Yeah. But eventually, somebody's got to make a decision. 
And it could very well be that it turns out that ASCE takes a position that in the end they decide to support something different. But if they sit around and do nothing, they're going to be the possum on the yellow line. They're just going to get run over. And that's also why we're trying to put together a group that is representative of the seven technical societies and all the people who are affected by any sort of change. Got to do something. I mean, you think about the, the last full time when the master degree was introduced was based on one individual. Right. The first time was right. somebody in Memphis, the second Absolutely. time was, I don't know where they That's just bad legislative process. Yeah, right. I mean, I just, I don't care, I don't care if I agree I mean, with it or I mean, not, I think it's a bad process. To some extent, process. today when we saw the two candidates, they were Mr. Patterson in this situation. Nobody's going to question that he cannot do engineering work for the things that he knows how, and he got a guy who was, he worked for, very influential, and understood that. And I think what, I guess one of my points is that in order to drive sense of urgency, we need to find somebody who's passionate enough to lead the charge. Right. Okay. Can you tell, can you have a machine where people put their finger in there? You can tell the love level, but instead of love level, it's a passion level. Passion. You select them oh. to the chief. Engineering passion. I, I, I'm trying to make sure those people have passion for it or it's in there on the table, because I think that helps. They're passionate people on both ends. Yeah, exactly. And then there's all these, everybody else is back in the middle. That's why ASCA yeah. can't decide because he has them all. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, why, don't, I, why don't we end our discussion on decoupling there? I guess if that's yeah. we uh, talked I'll about that. Um, I guess there's nothing left but adjournment unless somebody has something. Motion to move adjourn. We do we have a motion? You motion. gave a motion. I was always told by our lawyer that you didn't need a second on the motion to adjourn. Is that right? Robert Rules that you discussed. Robert Rules requires we will, follow, we will follow Robert's rules if that's what this board has been. What does that say? But other boards, can, some of the other boards don't. So. You can they make don't? them to suspend. Yeah, Robert's but you guys typically do. So, I think so it's Robert's rule? <laughs> okay, does anybody have a second? I think that based on the way we make motions in here, it's pretty common that, that we not use Robert's rules. <laughs> that's all right. All, all right. Second. All right, all in favor. Uh, let's, let's do it. Let's do it. All right.